Yo! Mainframe Comic Con, everybody. We are here. It's happening. It's now. You guys, it is so awesome to have you guys here. We really appreciate everybody coming. We really appreciate you going to mainframecomiccon.com. If you haven't yet, there is a complete breakdown of all the halls, all the things that are going on. This right here is Hall D. So welcome in to Hall D. And we're going to have an incredible set of panelists coming in here, some great YouTubers, friends in the community coming in here to, to interview people for us today. Uh, we're starting off with a banger, in my opinion. I'm a huge Why the Last fan. So if you have not seen or read Why the Last Man, you're in for a treat. Those of you that are big fans, you'll probably already know what's going on here. So let me uh, talk a little bit about MainframeComicCon.com, why you want to go over there. This is the website to go to for donating to the Hero Initiative. All of this, all the stuff we're doing all weekend long is free for you because all these creators want to support the hero initiative if you go to the website and you click you can donate a little bit of money to support the hero initiative charity which then supports your favorite creators when they need medical funding or anything that's going to support them in their retirement uh, any needs that need to be filled for them the hero initiative does that so you supporting them supports this con and gives you all this amazing free content also, we're on the White Whale Comics channel. He has super chats enabled here. So you can super chat and that money will also go to the Hero Initiative. It's also a great way if you have an important question you wanna ask, you can super chat that question and we can highlight it so that the panelists can see it and, and respond to you, all right? I'm super pumped that we're starting off with friends in this comic book community. If you guys watch, enough comic book YouTube, you know these two guys. We got them both here, the Two Brothers Comics. So let me introduce to you Nick and Dustin from Two Bros Comics. What's going on, John? What's up, what's going on? Welcome to the mainframe, guys. <laughs> Man, so you guys are super, I'm super jealous. This, this is gonna be an awesome panel. Uh, I'm yep. gonna get out of here and let you guys take over, but thank you guys for doing this, man. Absolutely, Absolutely. thanks, John. Thanks, man. All right, guys. So we're very, very excited to introduce our first guest. He's somebody that we're a fan of a lot of his work. And uh, with no further ado, let's introduce Mr. Goran Sujuka. Yes. Hello. How Hi, you doing, everybody. Goran? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Fantastic. So, guys, this is not just just Mr. Goran Sujuka. This is Eisner Award winning Goran Sujuka. And am I getting that name right? Yeah, yeah, you're getting the name right, yeah. Perfect, perfect. So, Mr. Gordon, man, we are very excited to have you here. Um, how are you doing this morning? I'm good, I'm good. Actually, I live in Croatia, which is six hours ahead of you. Yeah. So, it's not morning for me. It's six in the uh, afternoon. Oh, wow. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm <laughs> well awake. I had already my three <laughs> coffees, sipping on the fourth one, yeah. <laughs> is there anything we should be aware of that happens later on in the day? Yeah. <laughs> well, some things I'm going to miss, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Goren. So let's talk about a little bit about your early career. I know you had a very interesting kind of career early on. So mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a little bit about that and kind of what that was like for you kind of getting into um, being an artist as a comic book uh, creator. Okay. Well, I started really early right after the, I finished high school, first in animation studio, then doing some short comics comics yep. for creation uh, magazines and for the German horror anthologies. Yep. And I did some illustrations, storyboards for, for, for commercials and stuff like that. And I've been doing it for 10 years before I actually broke into the American market. Which is when you got involved in D with DC, right? Yes, that, that was Vertigo. That was Vertigo Comics. Mm -hmm. That was uh, 1999. Mm -hmm. I actually sent my first portfolio in 1998 to yeah. Axel Alonso, who was editor in Vertigo at the time. Okay. Uh, my good friend uh, and uh, genius comic artist, Edwin Biukovic, unfortunately late Edwin Biukovic, was working for Vertigo back then. 
And through him, I was uh, sending my portfolio to Axel Alonso. Okay. And he liked it, uh, but it was just a matter of time before they find the, the right project for me. And one year later, <laughs> I was in contact with him. I was sending him new stuff. And then after a year, uh, in the summer of 1999, they finally called me and offered me to work on the, the new monthly book they just started. Awesome. And that was uh, Outlonation. Yeah. Uh, uh, written by Jamie Delano and that was my big break in yeah now when you you talked about doing the animation studio what kind of work did you do with that well it was first it was a stone age that 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 was like 1989 <laughs> yeah so we basically didn't have I was, any yeah, I was born we, we're talking about doing it with hands you know everything but also I was working in Zagreb film, which is uh, like really famous uh, animation studio, but it is uh, much more, it was much more oriented to artistic. Yeah, uh, not as much on like stop motion stuff. stuff. Stuff you get to see on the festivals, not so much on okay. Cartoon Network. Okay. So that, that was really interesting. Uh, uh, and I learned a lot, not just about the animation, about the drawing, but uh, I was 19 back then, and I met the, the, the lots of people working there who were like from 20 to 70 years old. And I think that was a really valuable experience because you get to meet the professionals, yep. people that are doing stuff that you would like to do. And I learned a lot about how much work versus talent is, you know what some work ethics, uh, how to yeah. deal with the blockades and stuff like that. It, it, it was really important and, and really valuable the experience. Absolutely. There's yeah. nothing in the world that can replace a good mentor <laughs> or, or a good group yeah. of mentors for sure. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the animation stuff like that. I mean, I, I can only imagine how much more work it is, um, you know, with, with, with illustrations uh, I, I try to do like some kind of like I've, I've started trying to dabble into like stop motion with like action figures a little bit and like oh that's even tough. even that is like oh sometimes I think so that's kind of perfect so so after all of that so you went from outlaw nation and then in yeah. what was it 2001 right that's whenever you kind of started kicking off being a part of why last man no, that was later. I think that was 2004. 2004, yeah. okay. But 2001 yeah. when you won that. I spent, I spent three years working on Outlonation. Okay. Then I did a mini series called uh, Lady Joanna Constantine. Yeah. yeah. And then, then, then they called me to, to, to work on Why the Last Man. Yeah. That's awesome. And Why the Last well, Man, yeah. if nobody's, if you're not familiar with Why the Last Man, you absolutely should be. You it should is. read it, yeah phenomenal absolutely phenomenal it um, is. but so 2001 is when you won the um um the, the eisner eisner award right? well yeah yeah that's what i wanted to correct you when, when uh, yeah it's actually russ manning award okay this okay is, this is the award for the best newcomer it okay. is uh, presented at the eisner awards gotcha th this one that's for for, for the the best uh, newcomer this one is called russ manning and okay. This, this this is what I got. Yeah, this is what I got for my work on Outlonation. Yeah, perfect. So overwhelming. It's it's still unreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Absolutely. that's that's bigger than winning a Dundee. <laughs> I don't know if he's familiar. <laughs> so we do have a question for you from John. So so how challenging yeah. was it um, joining Why the Last Man with a team that had done thirty issues already? Ah, well, it was. It wasn't really that much challenging, but but I, I was really exciting, yeah, excited. Uh, it was uh, the situation where uh, I was already reading the series. I was a big fan of the series, and then they called me to to, to do a fill in issue, uh, to do a fill in arc. First time they called me, they, they wanted a story arc of four issues. This girl mm -hmm. and girl. So I was terribly, I, I was really excited, but uh, I was completely ready yeah uh, because you know i knew all the characters i loved what pia was doing and i think our, our i mean will dennis the, the editor he i think he, he the 
did a good thing about picking up the artist, you know, because yeah. I think my my style and and Pia style are not really that different. Mm -hmm. And also we had uh, Jose Marzan Jr. who was inking, yeah, the, the, the whole thing, and uh, Zilonal the studios they were doing the colors, mm -hmm. so that gave the, the the whole book kind of like unique style. Absolutely. And also, Brian, Brian was specifically in, in Why the Last Man. Uh, he had also a style of writing where you would always have these black captions of where and what is happening. Yeah. You know, so the pacing and everything comes from the script. So, so it it was a. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I was doing just the pencils. Yeah. Because I was doing yeah. the inks, and I was really comfortable with with him doing the inks. So doing a, a monthly book just pencils it wasn't really that hard on on, on, the, on the the schedule like with the deadlines and everything anyway i i enjoyed every minute of it so let me ask you this because at the time were you still living in croatia yeah yeah so what was that like working with i guess an american comic book publisher uh, all the way in croatia um how because at the time i mean mm -hmm. 2003 2004 you know or 2004 i guess the time period the the technology was at a certain level, but it's nowhere near what it is now. So how was yeah, that? It, it, it was different. Yeah, back then, uh, well, we had emails for correspondence. Yeah. Also, like when I would draw something, I would make a scan and then small JPEGs that I would send <laughs> through emails. Yeah. Uh, but once I'm done, I would uh, send the physical original art via FedEx. Oh, wow. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So on Alconation and Lady Joanna, where I would do pencils and inks, uh, once I'm done, I would send it to DC. But okay. with Why the Last Man, I would uh, send the pencil pages to Florida, where Jose was living. So I would oh. send the pencils to him. Yeah. And then he would ink them, and then he would send them to DC, which actually meant that we had the schedule and the deadlines that were shorter for couple yeah. of days at least you know but FedEx was really fast back then or maybe it was UPS but I, I, I'm not sure anymore I, yeah. I can I can imagine that doesn't leave a lot of um a lot of uh room for for any mistakes or anything like you you, you really had to be on your game with that kind of thing so I mean for you to yeah. be able to do that for so long man that says a lot about the quality of your work thanks thanks yeah but yeah it, it is it is different uh, than, than it, it was different than it is now yeah now if, if anything needs changing in the last minute you can still do it you know and just upload your files and that, that's really that's really different yeah yeah how many times did you have damaged art and have to redo it mm. through, through shipping how many times was your artwork damaged through shipping if any at never. all really never. it was never lost it was never damaged really i don't know if i'm lucky or if the service is still good yeah yeah i mean that's but one thing i had damaged was the, the very first uh page i did for why the last man is the one with the ship okay yeah, yeah. i actually spilled my coffee over it <laughs> <laughs> that's awful man uh, that's that's, that's crazy damaged. to think that that uh, you know all those shipments and nothing ever got lost or damaged i've had stuff lost and damaged that was shipped to me from you know three four hours away and yeah it doesn't make it here undamaged so i mean that's awesome i guess it was uh, we were lucky because really <laughs> never happened yeah so so after why the last man you continued to do a couple of more dc vertigo titles things like Hellblade, yes. right um and then that's when you really got back into um more indie stuff with your title ghosted correct um that you worked yeah. on skybound and image right yes yes that's true yeah yeah i i stayed with with, with vertigo for, for 10 years yeah all together yeah okay but after 10 years i think well this was this is also the time when when vertigo started to having trouble yep for less and less work and i was approached by joshua williamson the writer and Sean Mankiewicz, uh, who was the editor at the Skybound. Yep. Back then. And they actually approached me about a different uh, series. Okay. Uh, back then, I was just moving to Berlin and I couldn't start right away. So, and they wanted to start this other uh, book right away. Yeah. So, nothing happened with that. But then, yeah, then Joshua Williams pitched 
ghosted to them and uh, we agreed then I can start working on that like later I needed a few months to settle down in Berlin so that's when I was started working on ghosted yeah hmm. and then for a year I worked on the ghosted before we even uh, announced it or published it wow. and uh, when I was done with it then Cliff Chang and, and Brian Azarella invited me to uh, be a filling artist on, on Wonder Woman yep which was already going you know so that was very similar situation for me like like with uh, why the last man I yeah. was already uh, reading the, the series and I really liked it I was completely familiar with the material so I just jumped right in anyway so ghosted and Wonder Woman started be pub uh, was published kind of like at the same time yeah yeah so and they wanted me to do some more ghosted but in the meantime I started working for on Wonder Woman so yeah was, and then um, and then after that that's when you started going to Marvel and doing some pencils and inking right yes that's true that's true after finishing Wonder Woman uh I was I I had kind of like arrangement to start working on a new book that was mm -hmm. supposed to be like in six months or something like that so I contacted uh, all the other editors and told them that like you know if they need some short work you know I can hop in and this is how I started uh, working on some short stuff for, for Marvel in the meantime that book I was supposed to work on didn't happen so I just told them that you know I'm available yeah and so yeah so I I, I worked on a couple of short shorter books on, on, on uh, for Marvel mm -hmm. but I also uh, the my biggest mainstay was, was on Daredevil yep uh, the Charles Soberon yeah. which again was something you know I was really reading and enjoying and yeah. Ron Garney's art was just amazing yeah. <laughs> so I think that was to answer that question earlier I think that was like really challenging for me because unlike with Pia or Cliff Chang we're, where I think our style is kind of yeah. like similar or, or compatible uh with Ron Garney that was like really so different from me and then uh I was scared at the beginning, but it turned out I was really inspired. I, I, I'm really so, so happy with the work I did on Daredevil. That was really great. Uh, absolutely. So what was that like? I mean, every it seems like, you know, when you jump in, <clears throat> that's got to be an amazing feeling to be able to, to add value or be a part of something that you're such a big fan of, right? Mm -hmm. With Why the Last Man, Daredevil, some of these other ones. Yeah. I mean, that's going to be pretty incredible. Well, it is. In, in, in a way, it's, it's really incredible. In a way, it's ungrateful, you know, because basically everybody who loves the series, for yeah. love it both for, for, for the writing and for the art. Mm -hmm. So the main artist is always like the favorite one. So yeah. The best thing you can do is like, you know, uh, to, you know, kind of like fill his shoes, but still be your own, you know? Yeah, right. absolutely. Uh, so, you know, basically the biggest compliment you can get from a fan is like, oh, I didn't really miss the main artist. Yeah, but still, it, it was all, all three of them were like my, my really one of the best experience I, I had. Absolutely. And then so let, let's talk about kind of your more recent one and something that came out in a hardcover format. Um, yeah. So so your book, um, A Walk Through Hell, right? So yeah. you were um, working on this with um, Garth right. Ennis, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Well, this is uh, uh, well, this is. First, this is like probably my, my most important work for the moment because uh, it is a creator owned and yep. uh, I did the complete series. I did all the art and uh, and I was really, really excited because I love Garth Hennis work yep. since you know, like <laughs> five years ago. You know? yeah. I, really, I, I met him briefly at, 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 in New York at the Comic Cons uh so we like know each other but we're not friends you know and i wasn't really, yeah. really in contact with him so i was really surprised when when they uh, approached me yeah. and asked if i would like to work with him you know and uh i was working on daredevil at the time and i was really really happy with the daredevil and and both uh, the editors mm -hmm. and charles Saul were really happy with, with what i was doing and they yeah. wanted me to stay but I got this offer and it was, you know, it was a tough choice in a way, you know. I bet. But still, you know, 
this this is you know this is Garth Ennis. It's a creator own book, so <laughs> and, there, and will, think... will always be there. You know, maybe I can I will come back someday to him or tomorrow, whatever. But yeah. this was really the chance I I I, I wouldn't miss. You know, and so, and I think so... Nick. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, me and Nick can definitely agree, and I think a lot of people that some of the absolute best. Uh, uh, comics, whether it be the art, the stories, all of that is is the creator own stuff. Yep. So to be able to to be a part of some of this creator own uh, comics that are coming out, man, that's mm -hmm. that to me, that's where you want to be because that 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 stuff right there. You know, we were kind of talking a little bit backstage. That's the stuff that is just really taking over right now and capturing people. Yep. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. I mean, it's a, it's it's a it's a whole different thing, you know. I mean, uh, well, you can't really compete with DC and Marvel when you're talking about superhero comics. Yeah. Not just because they are big companies. It's because yeah. of the, you know, decades of heritage and, yeah. you know, masterpieces that's been done, you know. And uh, when you're doing your own stuff, you know, you have a clean slate, you know, you can, yep. you know, it's, it's just your own and, and it's different, you know. And for me, especially because Outlaw Nation that I did for Vertigo, it's also, also uh, creator-owned. It's been done yeah. for Vertigo, but it's Jamie's and mine, you know. So this is also how I started, you know, in my career. And so this is kind of like going back to the roots, you know. But Absolutely. still, like when I was working on, on, on Wonder Woman or, or Daredevil, I think it's because of the, the, the people I was working with, uh, I really enjoyed it, you know. Yeah. I, feel like you know being just a part of the machine or you know right you know. And, and it probably takes a little bit of the pressure off too when you're working on something like daredevil and wonder woman you have so many fans who have these expectations and and you have like a parameter to work within but once you get on one of these brand new creator owned independent titles like you said it's a clean slate and, yeah. and people don't have those expectations yet. So you have the ability to just blow their mind right off the bat with something and, and capture yeah. them on something completely new. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's one of the big positives to that too. It is, it's true, you know, but in a way it's, it, it's also like, it, it's a freedom, but it's kind of like, not really a pressure, but it's a challenge where you right. have to create everything, you know, in, in a way, working on, on franchise is easier because, you know, you have to just follow what's been done. Right. You know, your parameters, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a well oiled, oiled machine, you know, mm -hmm. and just right. Go, you know. But this, this is the completely different stuff. Yeah. yeah you you kind of get it. It's also, you know, test. like big differences, like, uh, uh, I've been working for more than 10 years for American publishers. Yeah. And, before I started working on Wonder Woman, I've been going to the conventions back then, and I would meet people who, you know, who just discovered my name or my yeah. work with Wonder Woman, because you know, and then they would like it, and then they would maybe you know go and, and try something else I did, usually Why the Last Man. But yeah. you know, there are so many people that are not reading anything outside outside, outside of superheroes, you know. Yeah, and that's something that you know we really push hard at our indie comics. Um, if you look at our pull lists, I bet you ninety five percent are indie comics. Yep. Um, but, because yeah. they need they need the kind of the exposure, like, the mouth uh, advertisement, you know, whatever yep. you can do. You know? And because, I've got a friend you know, when new Superman comic is out, you know, you really don't have to advertise it. You know, everybody knows it's gonna be out. Everybody's waiting for it. You know, or Batman. Yeah. Or by them and whatever and this is especially when when it's something new you know uh, when you Absolutely. have a new book coming out because books like you know why the last man wasn't a huge hit right away nope it took time and, and not just that not to even mention the walking dead or you know yeah <laughs> so many, no there are so many books that's been going on and on and on and on and you kind of have to like keep on doing it, you know, and you have yeah. to have the support of the publisher and everything because before it catches up, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I would, I would love to, because I know we're getting close to wrapping up. So I'd oh, love yeah. for you to kind of um, tell people who are watching this, um, mm -hmm. give them a little bit more information about uh, Walk Through Hell, kind of what it's about um, and, and okay. why they should go pick this book up. Because it did just come out in a new hardcover format, yes. which is gorgeous. Yeah. 
So, uh, well, walk through hell. I okay. I'm gonna put it down so I can concentrate. Uh, walk through hell is uh, it, it's a horror story. Yeah, but it's it's really in a way so based in reality that, that it, in a way that's what makes it scarier than anything else. It's a self-contained story. Yeah. So this hardcover that's just been published. This is the the, the complete series that was originally in 12 issues or two yeah. trade paperbacks you know so you can buy it you can read it as a graphic novel as a complete story it's gonna keep you awake at night <laughs> for sure but i think it will leave. also make you think about what you're gonna do with your life and how you're gonna treat other people you know and hopefully it's gonna make yeah. you a better person it's not gonna make you optimistic but hopefully it's going to make you a better person. You know? I love it. <laughs> Scare yeah. you into being a better person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome guys. So I know, I know it's on Amazon. Where else can they go find this book if they want to pick it up? Well, I'm probably, I, I guess through Aftershock, the publisher. Okay. Uh, and I, I suppose in comic shops. I yep, really you, you, know I'm sitting here yeah. in my creation home and then I got my comps. So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. So so here in the US, you can definitely go pick it up at your comic shop, order it through Diamond. Um they'll order, the, yeah, they'll order it through Diamond. It is on Amazon, which here here in the US, obviously you can get it'll, it'll show up your, at your door in two days. So definitely go yeah. do that. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous book, gorgeous story. Um and uh definitely want to uh make sure you guys at home uh, know about that. So, and then I know that you're also another thing I wanted to talk to you about. So you're also selling some art, um, through, uh, mainframe comic-con online right now through splash page art, correct? Some original. Yes, art. Yes. So I've talk to me about page that art for, for a long time now. Yeah. I, I'm really happy with Mark, how he's doing things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I have, a well, lots of the art, like people always ask me about why the last man, but that's been sold a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I yeah. was so happy back then because it's selling. Yeah. And now I wish I kept some of that, you know, but that's yeah. been sold a long time ago, you know. And but there are still lots of uh, pages there from Daredevil, from Thor's, from Wonder Woman, from Ghosted. Yep. Uh, pages from Walk Through Hell are not for sale yet. No I'm worries. Still emotionally really attached to them. So <laughs> no I'm, worries. I'm well, not man. Selling that's a good uh, but the head over to splash page, uh, comic art, there, there are a lot besides me, there are really so, some lots of great artists there. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. So, so Goran, we do appreciate your time. We appreciate yeah. you guys, you being a part of main brain comic Thank you for having me. Tell everybody at home where they can find you, um, on, you know, social media and, and anywhere oh, else. Okay. Tell okay. Well, uh, the only social media I'm doing at the moment is Instagram. Perfect. So type my name. You can, you know, without this little V on Z, yeah, <laughs> on Instagram, and you will find me. Yep. You'll find some of the older stuff I'm doing, you know, I, I have been doing before. You will find some not much pics of cats and dogs. Yep. Well, dog and cats, <laughs> and a little bit of tease from my new upcoming book. I'm not allowed to speak about yet. No. <laughs> But it's great. I can tell you only it's for AWA. Studios. Wow. Yeah. So, so 20 years ago, Axel Alonso was the guy who, you know, got me into American market. Yep. And actually, we never really worked together. 20 years later, yeah. we are finally working together. And I'm really excited. We have a brilliant and hilarious and exciting book working on. Yeah. And that's about as much as I can tell you. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> AWA is A killing yeah, it. Yeah, AWA is. They they yeah, are, they are on, putting out some I mean, great books. Yeah. yeah, they came on hot and heavy, and they are they are really pushing out some great stuff. So they are. They are. Thanks again, man. We we really enjoyed you being on here. Thanks to everyone watching. Thank you very uh, much, guys. Thanks everybody for watching. Absolutely. Yeah. Any and and guys, uh, we're this is going to be going on all day long. All your super chats and and all that are all going to be donations. They're going to be put to the Hero Initiative. So thank you guys for all that. We appreciate it so much. And uh, John, we'll turn it back over to you. But thank you, Gordon. We do appreciate you, sir. And thank you uh, very much. Enjoy the show. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And yeah, awesome stuff.
and we are bouncing from awesome indie comics to awesome indie comics in Hall D here today. Uh, thank you for those of you that are hanging around. Like they said, please check out mainframecomiccon.com. You'll find the schedule for the whole day. You can click through to all the different panels, all the different halls. But right now, you're going to want to stay here because we are going to rock this with Source Point Press big time right here, right now. I got a full panel hanging out backstage, including another great YouTube buddy of mine. Justin's hanging out. He's ready to rock and roll. But before I bring on any of that, I'm bringing. I want to remind you that this is all for the Hero Initiative, and on mainframecomiccon.com, you can donate to the Hero Initiative. This is all free. This is all streaming here on YouTube. That no cost to you because we're trying to support a really great cause, and that's why all these great artists, all these great writers, and all these great producers are here. So just as a reminder, that's where you can find the link to do that. On this panel, you can also do a super chat. If you have a really important question you want to ask uh, about this book they're going to be sharing with you, you can do a super chat. All that money is going to go to charity as well, and it just makes it a little easier sometimes with all the chat to find that one comment. Now I'm going to bring in the co-founder, the artistic director for Source Point Press, Mr. Joshua Werner. Thank you so much for being here, man. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, the first time around when Mainframe Comic Con happened, uh, I got kind of thrown in the mix at the end, and I was blown away by how well you guys pulled it off. I mean, it was <laughs> 24 hours around the clock, and uh, I knew it was uh, it was a huge endeavor, big undertaking on everybody's part, and uh, you nailed it. And this time around, it's you just set the bar so Dude, high. I, I'm blown away. It's so much bigger than I ever imagined. So yeah, it's incredible, man. We hear about your book too. I was reading about it this morning. The book you guys are going to be discussing here sounds incredible. Yeah, it's uh, there's been a lot of hype, a lot of anticipation for it. It's definitely one of our, our hottest titles this year for sure. So I'm going to jump backstage. You call out people and I'll bring them in here to join you. This is the Source Point Press channel uh, for the next 30 minutes. So enjoy, man. Thanks. Thanks so much, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, so, uh, so like John said, I'm Josh and uh, I, um, I'm going to be talking with some of the cool, awesome creators of Broken Gargoyles, which is um, a, a three-issue miniseries that uh, has issue one hitting shops at the end of this month. Um, so I would like to welcome Bob Sally, the writer and creator of Broken Gargoyles. Thanks, and Bob. thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> really excited to be here. You got a mic? Look how pro you look. You got a mic? Yeah. So, this is the stuff that Justin Birch does. He puts little word balloons on things. You even uh, yeah, you you can take his job over now. That's it. Um, and and uh, I want to bring in uh, Drina Joe. She is the uh, the editor who's been keeping Bob in line. Hi, Drina. Hi. And um and Justin Birch, who um I who's one of my favorite letterers in the world, and I think Hi, um, Justin. the comic ha got to really really show off his skills. So thanks for coming on with me, Justin. I appreciate it, man. Hey, no problem. I'm, I'm glad that Bob's going to be taking my job. I appreciate that. You you made sure that you brought the most impressive background amongst all of us here. Right. I watch your collection from afar. It is uh, Seriously. One day you should just kind of pan through all of those and just let, yeah. without any soundtrack or anything, just let people absorb it all in. Bob, did you get a haircut? It's a camera no, trick. You actually, it's on the other side, which is all just like boxes of garbage. I want everyone to know this right here is a hundred percent. I I like the only thing I've done is trim my own sides. This is <laughs> just like waiting for the pandemic. This is all pandemic growth. Isn't it crazy? I cut my own hair too. I was just like. <laughs> it's also it's kind of an experiment too to see how yeah. long your hair gets. <laughs> I got my hair cut at a super cuts, and. It was great to yeah. just be out, getting my hair cut by uh, somebody other than my mom holding the ball. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're going to talk about Broken Gargoyles. Uh, like I said, it's a three issue mini series. Uh, issue one is hitting shops at the end of this month, and then it's monthly from there. So, issue two next month, and three the following. Um, issue three is available to pre-order right now. So, if you if you have been looking into this series and you're worried about getting your hands on it in stores, you have a right to be worried because I have no doubt that this is going to sell out really quickly. So, I, I highly recommend you get a pre-order in either on the SourcePoint web store or at your local comic book shop like as soon as possible because um, uh, once this first issue drops and it's gone, it's 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 gone. Um, 
And I want to mention it now before everybody starts going to the series two, that there is a, a very limited edition variant cover that's available exclusively right now here at Mainframe Comic Con. So, Con.com. You don't have to do it this second uh, if you want, you know, or open a second window or whatever. But it'll be up all weekend, and then it's being marked sold out. And whatever is sold, that's it. That's all that's being printed. So, uh, it's there are two versions for fourteen ninety nine. You can get um, uh, you can get a rare variant cover uh, that has a painting by me, and then for uh, for 30, you can get um, a limited edition chromium cover. And that one we're capping the sales on. So you might see that one get marked sold out anytime. So that one I recommend acting on really fast. And uh, and of course, um, definitely donate to the Heroes Initiative because that's uh, such a great cause. Um, so uh, if, for those who don't know, uh, Broken Gargoyles is a period piece it's set in 1925. Um, Bob, what were some of the challenges of uh, setting this in 1925 and making it uh, palatable and interesting and understandable but accurate to the time period? Uh, well, there was a lot of research, which um, I haven't really had to do that yet in my comics because I did science fiction where you can just do whatever you want. Uh, and then doing fantasy, I think the most research that I did was like Sean Daly telling me to read up on D&D &D gaming and then I just like watched like Lord of the Rings again. But, uh, you know, this one was like a little more involved. It was, uh, you know, going through the time of 1920s, uh, post-World War I. And even though it's set in like an alternate history, diesel punk world, uh, it was still important to me. And I think to the genre of diesel punk to keep things accurate to a certain extent. And, um, you know, having an editor like Drina is, uh, she's very uh, particular and meticulous as editors should be. Um, you know, it was just, uh, it was great. And it was a great learning experience. I mean, I learned a lot about, and I'm still learning a lot because um, even though vol this is volume one or chapter one, the these first three issues, uh, we are, I'm now writing the next volume. And uh, so there's even more, kind of goes into a, a different part of American society or the American um, geography. So now I'm researching new stuff. And because I really want to, I want this to, I, I want readers to read this and, you know, see what, um, you know, post-World War I was like in America. Uh, but as, you know, also it, uh, Travis actually McIntyre was the one when I brought this up was the one to say like, let's do this in a diesel punk. And I never really knew like what diesel, I knew what steampunk was, but diesel punk was kind of new to me. And then researching diesel punk along with researching the 1920s, you really kind of like seeing things where you're like, it almost was a diesel punk type of world. In the 1920s. Yeah. Um, and then like I'd read uh, Grapes of Wrath before and then Travis told me to read um, East of Eden and I don't know if it was because I was learning so much about diesel punk, but uh, reading Steinbeck was almost like he was writing in the diesel punk world. So um, I don't know. It just all seemed to fit. And then uh, when you see like what steampunk and diesel punk, like the the time periods that those pieces, like those genres take place in, you're like, it, it just, it seemed, it, it really fit. And it fit for how dark, like I know a lot of people think like 1920s, it's the roaring 20s. Um, but, you know, researching it, it was like a really tough time for America. Especially those who came back from the war. Yeah. I, so to, to that diesel punk aspect, I want to bring up a small point. Um, so Prescott is a character who his, uh, his dialogue is lettered in a really specific way. And every time I look at it, I, my heart breaks for you, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to go through lettering Prescott, but you definitely captured a really cool look. And I can say that I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it in comics before. Um, but it's not distracting and it works and it fits to the character. You've really kind of developed a, a cool voice for him uh, visually, which is awesome. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, when uh, Bob first approached me about this book, it was pretty much a do whatever you want, but I have like a specific type of thing that I want done for this specific character. 
And so we kind of just traded ideas back and forth and this is what we settled on. And the funny part is I was really happy and excited with the way it turned out. Yeah. And then um, I think I did maybe like three pages just as a sample, just to get a feel for it. And I'm like, okay, I can handle this. This is great. <laughs> and then I realized that it wasn't a three page book. It was a <laughs> book. I'm like, okay, I didn't think this one through. I'm going to have to do this a lot more than I thought. And I think you actually, you, we, we ran into each other at a convention, Josh, and you're like, that looks great. How are you going to do that all the time now? <laughs> yeah, right up the end, I'm like, because it's one of those things where you can't just use the same one and then resize it when there's longer dialogue. You have to. So for people who haven't seen the book, um, how would you describe it? It's almost like um, it's almost like the the edges of the dialogue balloons are, are almost like a chainsaw. So you have these these cool, jagged, very mechanical gear like edges yeah. to them. And you have to, the, the, I would, let's refer to them as teeth, for example. You have to add more teeth as the dialogue grows. You can't just blow them up and make them bigger. because it would be really obvious. So there's no easy way. It's like, it's very customized. It's like every single panel you had to do custom. Is that accurate? It, it is. It took me, it probably, I didn't get a real good hang of it or handle for it until about halfway through issue one. And that's when I was like, Okay, I have a system on how we're going to do this. This is, this is how it's going to work. Yeah, it's having trouble focusing on it, but you kind of get yeah. yeah. So can I say that Justin works very well under pressure? <laughs> oh, I know. That's why you're my favorite. Favorite. You know that. Nobody else. <laughs> you guys, it's like, there's a little side conversation, <laughs> but uh, I own beers. Well. <laughs> I, I think that's part of the job description of a letterer is to work under pressure, right? Work under tight de deadlines. You might, I might complain about it all the time, but that doesn't stop me from doing it. Everyone else will take, uh, if there's 30 days to get it done, they'll take the 29 days <laughs> and then they'll get yeah. you everything you need all at once. And they'll be like, all right, Justin, you got, uh, got 24 hours to meet that deadline. I hope you can uh, <laughs> do it. Oh God. He wishes he has 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> Give it to him at eight o'clock. And I'm like, Josh needs this by four. <laughs> no sleep tonight. Um, I mean, it's not it. I mean, how hard is it? How did Stan Yak? So Stan Yak is the uh, is the artist on this, and um, how did he adjust to to the period and and the Diesel Punk? There's a lot of it's an extremely visual book, and I mean everything from like the streets and the crowds and the costuming. I mean, it's mind blowing. It's the, it's one of the most cinematic comic books I've seen of recent years. Uh, you look at it, and it's like a movie unfolding, and there's just an entire huge cast and everything in it. I mean, we're talking products and posters and vehicles, and then you bring in this diesel pug aspect to it, where you have to fit in the period, but you're also adding a, like a fictitious element. So you can kind of almost exaggerate the technology to to an extent. Uh, how how did Stan tackle all this? It's, uh, so when I presented Stan with the idea and like we were doing the character concepts, like he went like full blown post apocalyptic, and I was just like, no, 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 we're going, we're going back in time. Like you know, I mean, he had uh, you know like the the Manco had like you know a busted up. Uh, he had like some like license plates as like <laughs> you know, like very armor, nice. and yeah, and it looked and I have them still, but it looked pretty cool. And I was like, no, 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 like this is like post World War One diesel punk like we need to like fit it for that and uh but he did great you know and then my whole thing like the way i, I think like stan and i've worked together is like just talking to all like we've talked it out like it's not like a lot of visual i do give them visual references but it's it, we we work well together like where i told him i said you know where i want to show where new york city is like you know, heaven and it's, um, you know, the, the golden age of society. And then we go out, you know, Midwest and it's like hell and things are like broken apart. And it's, I just, I, cause I mean, I do know like in the 1920s, like there was, it was a thriving time for some, but I wanted to show like the balance of like where it was hard times for others. So when, you know, I, I purposely like was like, I wanted to start in New York so we could see and he could really like the first opening page where he shows like New York city in like this uh, almost like um, you know, that, uh, that movie, I can't think of the movie, what it was, but it was um, with Jude law. And he was like the, I think it was like sky captain. Oh, oh uh, right? like New York city was just like, 
beautiful. And it was the buildings like had that like art deco. And so I wanted to show that, you know, to open it up. And then, and he just blew up with it. He was, uh, you know, he took forever on that page because he was just like, so again, like meticulous about it. Um, you know, and then little by little, it was like, you know, I think we both kind of just looked up a lot of diesel punk cars. Um, like I just sent him an image of a diesel punk gun uh, just to kind of like be like a reference point. And, uh, but I think as the story's gone on, he's really adapted to making the 1920s look like it's futuristic and, um, you know, getting pages from them. Like I'm, I'm excited to see them. And then I send them to Drina and, you know, we just kind of like have a little powwow for about, a, you know, a little, like, like how beautiful it is. And then we'll look at it a little longer and be like, this is wrong. Like we gotta, and then you gotta go back to stand and be like, Hey, you gotta switch this or that. And, but, um, but the process has been awesome. Uh, so to, to Drina, there's, there's obviously there's a lot of moving parts in yeah. the comic and there are, a, there is a big cast of characters and there's like these kind of overlapping story elements, but at its core, this is kind of a man versus man story with Manko and Prescott. Um, how did you keep, Bob's ideas in line to make sure that it was just suiting issue by issue pace. How was the pacing a struggle? God, no. I mean, Bob's a pro. <clears throat> Sorry. Wow. No. Look at all this. Uh, Bob has like, Bob's a genius. I don't think he realizes it, but he's. You tell Travis McIntyre that daily. <laughs> for I have to tell Travis that. I have. But he had a very clear idea of what he wanted before he ever even messaged me. So there wasn't a lot to do to change any of the characters because they all had already been pretty well fleshed out and were, you know, substantial characters already. Um, the only thing that I really have to keep in check with Bob is like, <laughs> Bob, <laughs> where is it? It's on. It was, it was, you know, it was the COVID. So, yeah, the creators that are watching this right now, I hope, I think, can relate because I, I, I've talked to a few. When COVID hit, I think all these creators were like, "This is great. I'm going to be able to have so much time to get all my stuff done." And mm -hmm. then you're like sitting on the couch and you're like watching Avengers all over again. You're like. You're like, I haven't seen The Matrix in five years. Let me watch that whole trilogy again. And next thing you know, two months went by, and you're yeah. like, I didn't do, I didn't do a damn thing. And well, I actually I, I got to get it from Chicago, Josh. <laughs> so I was out of the game for six weeks, and no one had even messaged me in six weeks to be like, so are you going to edit this or not? Because nobody was doing anything. <laughs> no, we weren't doing anything. We were done. It was. I mean, the pages, like, so Stan was working on the pages that he had, and Robert was doing, but it was, uh, I think it was more issue three, was just kind of sitting there, and I was like, oh, I'm going to get to it tomorrow, or, like, or it was like, this Saturday, like, I don't have the kids this weekend, I'm going to really, I'm going to get, I'm going to get, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get to work, and then it's Sunday night, and you're like, oh, I mean, this was I this get a message Sunday weekend, night. I might as well just drink. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything to do this week, you know, so it was just, it was tough, like, to, I know Dirk Manning's watching right now, so, you know, he's a creator that could probably uh, put his two cents in, you know, but I would love to know, like, what other creators were doing, like, where, where was it hard for you guys to, like, really get involved into your projects, or was it something where you were like, I don't know. No, um, obviously, there's been, there's been a struggle with this, uh, with this art team because they're they're simultaneously doing another series, monthly series at the exact same time. So there's they've got half the amount of time to pump out these issues. But that aside, I mean, knowing that there was there was a long development period of kind of getting the ducks in a row for this, uh, has has Dan and Robert been pretty much self starters and kind of like just chugging along? Oh yeah, I mean it's not like so they the artists haven't really been like not doing anything. It's more me. <laughs> like, it, was, it was me, the one that was kind of dragging my feet. But it wasn't, again, I'm like, now I feel like I'm guilty. It wasn't like I didn't have anything for the artists to do. 
I just was like, well, eventually they're going to catch up to me and then I'll give them pages to do, which I did. I mean, I think like me, I work well under pressure, just like Justin does. Yeah. Just not as well as I don't, I don't really stress it because I know he's going to get it done and you can't force him to write because then he doesn't put out, you know, good stuff. It's when he's ready to write that he puts out the great stuff. Sorry. (laughs) Am I being mean? (laughs) <laughs> okay. No, that makes sense. Being truthful. So for those, I mean, so far, for anybody who wasn't aware of Broken Gargoyles, this far into the panel, they've pretty much gotten the sense that it's a period piece that is diesel punk. Um, they've heard some names and they know that there's some really strong visual elements, but uh, can you give like a brief synopsis of what they can expect in the storyline? Uh, why should they, why should they pick this up? Uh, basically. So Broken Gargoyles is a, it's a, again, we said it's a period piece post-World War I, and it is uh, two men who are home from war, uh, disfigured, and they are not experiencing a, the homecoming that they thought that they were going to get. Uh, they did things, as the story goes on, you see um, the, the things that happened to them in war, and uh, one of them is has a family and is losing that family because of, uh, you know, what he, you know, the product he is now at home. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't have a job, uh, he's drinking and he's looking for redemption for the things he's done. And, uh, the other one has been, so he, half of his face has been damaged. So he wears, um, he wears a mask that's very, very accurate to the time period. For if anybody's ever seen the photos of the soldiers that came back from World War One, they would have sometimes false noses or they would get, they would have like plastic with, uh, with an eye painted on top of yeah, it. It's of an eye. And yeah. to say the least, it, it's not the most convincing prosthetics. Uh, it's what they had to do to, fit in just so people couldn't see the scarring, but it's still very, it's for the time, I would say it's, it's, it's off putting for a job or something. They, it's very, very hard for someone like him to get work. Right. And then the, uh, again, like the researching of these, these people and they were, they called themselves broken gargoyles. Uh, they did not have the same, they did not have the same homecoming that say somebody who lost a leg or somebody who lost an arm. Um, and I think like researching and everything, it just kind of made me feel like, you know, what would it be like to not, like not be able to express yourself, you know, with a smile, uh, or, you know, be able to, you know, cry or be able to have somebody look into your eyes or, or even just to like see somebody coming home from war and, you know, their face is so disfigured that, you know, like you don't want that in front of you. You don't want to hire that person because you don't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. Um, and that was where I think it started to speak to me. And I, it started to like make me think like, you know, if you have these characters, like there's a story in there and, you know, developing the characters was really what kind of brought out the story. And, uh, you know, so it is like, it's these two characters, one um, on a, on a quest for redemption and the other one on a quest for revenge. And they are, you know, heading right toward each other. Uh, they were at war with each other. And again, as the story's told, we see more and more of, you know, the link between the two of them and, um, you know, and what, what, you know, where the conflict is between them. Not to give too much to bring in uh, the, the carnival aspect of the story. It's one of my favorite things about it. It's rough, isn't it? It's just so yeah. rough. And again, I mean, the carnival aspect was just uh, through another, it was another step in the process of researching what life was like in that era. And, um, you know, the, the carnival life was horrible. Like it was, you know, that, that was where, you know, it was like you, people paid money to go and see the spectacle of it. But, you know, without really thinking about what was going on behind the scenes and, um, you know, how these people were treated like animals. And that was another part that I wanted. You know, it was just another thing that I wanted to add to it. And, um, you know, I had a character that, again, these characters were all um, they were all injured 
in World War One, and when they came back, they each of them kind of were displaced in what they needed to do to survive. And uh, there's a character who is doing what he needs to survive by being a part of this carnival. And um, so that was like, it, it, it was a great, again, like uh, when you see Stan's art uh, in issue one, it's like three different, uh, it's like three different settings. And the certain, like the carnival setting was um, just beautifully drawn. I mean, the colors and, uh, you know, yeah. the, what he able, was able to do with it. Robert and, really like, he lets you know where you are through the colors and the carnival is one of the things that pop the most because everything else has a very, uh, like almost sepia tones to it. Yeah. But um, that's probably one of my favorite scenes as well. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're doing it all and there's really like, I, the, the inspiration for the way I wrote this was Breaking Bad where like there wasn't really a definitive villain or a definitive hero in Breaking Bad. Like even though like in the beginning you're like Walter White, but as the story went on, you were like, even Gus, you're like, Gus wasn't that bad. Like he was just selling meth. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just like uh, I, I just wanted to bring that out. So you're kind of like, all right, well, I need a villain. And, you know, like you do need somebody who you want the, you know, the, you want the readers to hate. So it was very easy to, when I was writing the circus, it was like, you know, the ringleader is the stereotypical villain in this one. So um, and then I kind of liked him a lot. I liked the villain that he was. So I was like, well, bring him with us. It's definitely, it's one of my favorite things about this is that um, your heart breaks for both Mako and Prescott. And you can understand why both of them are doing the things that they're doing. Uh, it, one is, is almost a terrorist and you get him. You understand him and you're on his side. And the other one feels like a, almost a traitor to his own brothers from the war by hunting him down. But you also understand why he's doing it. Uh, it's a complicated relationship. It's, there is no, no good and evil here, which I, I think is yeah, brilliant. Um, I think one of the best compliments I got by somebody who reviewed it was that when they, by looking at the cover, they were like, I thought this was just going to be another, you know, hard, hard ass, good guy going after like some bad guys, you know, but when I read it, it was like so much more than that. And um, I think I like the cover because of that, like the cover does kind of throw you off a little bit, but uh, you know, I was, I, I really loved that he said that because it is different. It's not your, um, your stereotypical good guy going after a bad guy. Uh, it's more it's more complicated than that. Um, so everyone is uh, uh, Ryland Grant's up uh, next, and uh, we have uh, we have a little bit of time, so we're going to do probably about six or seven more minutes if um, if everybody's up for it. Um, well, so for those who are about to read issue one, if you haven't um, if you haven't already pre-ordered issue two and three, the whole miniseries is available to pre-order right now. Uh, you can do it at the source point website. You can also um, you can also ask your local comic shops to get it through Diamond Comic Distributors. If your shop says Diamond is sold out, we don't have any for you. It's really important that everyone understands what that means because Diamond being sold out does not mean the book is unavailable. It doesn't mean the book is sold out. Um, when Diamond gets the purchase orders from all the stores, they say. I think I'm gonna stock five of these on my shelf. I want two, I want, I'm gonna skip it this time. I want one, I guess, we'll see what happens. Oh, hey, I want 10, I've got some you know, people who are interested. Diamond gives the order to the publisher, the publisher prints, and then Diamond, when it's, when it's not Marvel and DC or bigger publishers, um, they usually only add on a little bit more, right? So um, they, it's, they have to test the waters. So when it sells out, um, they usually come back to us and they place a reorder. Um, so that means that there might be a little bit of a wait. Um, so don't worry. But if you're worried that it will sell out fully, I uh, highly recommend you start talking to your shops right now. And, uh, and Diamond Comp distributors will start cataloging that information and get us the reorders we need so that we make sure everybody who wants a copy can get one uh, un until we run out at source point. Um, but we're definitely, we know this is a really anticipated series and we're trying to... Uh, to make sure the print runs are, are sizable enough where where people can read this. 
and uh, and not have to hunt on eBay for copies. Um, but if you are a fan and you you want something really collectible and rare and limited edition, the Mainframe Comic Con Broken Guard Girls number one exclusive variant cover is available this weekend. This weekend only. Um, if you go to the shop tab on mainframecomiccon.com, uh, it's one of the first products you're going to see. There's there's uh, there's two versions. There's one that just has the uh, it's the logo and the, and the cover art, which is a, a painting of Manko that I did. And then there is one that is just the painting version by itself on a metallic chromium cover. So it's going to reflect a whole rainbow of colors through his face. It's going to be really cool. And um, uh, those are the two options if you want to snag one. We're going to be marking them sold out at the end of the day at the end of mainframe comic-con. So whatever is sold is is sold and everything else is gone. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it definitely act fast uh, if you if you want to get your hands on one. Uh, I know Justin, he's already stocked up. He's ordered like 30 of them. He's gonna put it, he's gonna take all those toys out of there and just throw them in the garbage and just put a bunch of copies <laughs> of those in those glass cases. I mean, that's what they want. <laughs> and it's, uh, how, how, does your, how does your wife handle the toy collection? I've got to ask. I think it's one of those things where um, when, so, you know, I'm in the basement and this serves as both like the collection room slash my office. So I think one of the things that she does when she needs to walk through here to get to like the laundry room or something is she just kind of puts, you know, blinders on. <laughs> so it's kind of, she just ignores everything until, yeah. I, I think that's what it is. I that's really want all, all, all of them. You made your major, major sex appeal go higher to her. I'm sorry? I thought every new figure you added to the collection would made your sex appeal go higher so that she just, well, she just wanted you. I, mean, I don't know if a sex appeal can go any higher. Look at him. It's I mean, true. Yeah. That's like, <laughs> the scene. I know I, I know. when I see you at cons, I have a hard time keeping my hands off you. <laughs> I, thought that was for, I thought that was for different reasons, though. <laughs> Justin, what other uh, titles are you lettering right now uh, for Source Point? We don't care about anyone else. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. You, <laughs> you, you tell me. <laughs> um, claim. Oh, okay. Great. One. Based on the hit card game series from Deepwater Games, which, of which there are like numerous expansion packs coming out for right now, there is a, a comic book series in the works right now that we're super stoked about that Justin's supposed to be lettering that he forgot exists. Um, there's I, more. I, I, there's uh, something that hasn't come out yet. I just finished up an issue of Monstrous within the past month, I think. Mm, oh, Witch Hunt? Monstrous Witch Hunt? The new series that's out right now, so number four. I, I don't think it was Witch Hunt. Number three. It was a different one. There's so I, many. There's so many monsters. If it, people don't know, Monstrous is a uh, wildly popular comic book world. Uh, at some point, point. We, we need to get some more letterers. Yeah, <laughs> we need to get some more. Dial P. Trina, what are you? Um, what are you editing for Source Point right now? Dude. <laughs> Uh, I'm on like 14 titles. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, but I don't, I think only like a few of them are out of source point because they're, they're trying to gear up for the submission to source point. And I'm very, you know, like you said, meticulous and strict. So I want it 75% done before I present it to you guys. So people but, are basically like, I have, I have a pitch. I have a book in the works. I really want source point to publish it. If yeah. I Drina Joe to edit my scripts for me. I Maybe she can slip it in there. You know Erin Keepers. You met her in Chicago. So oh, yeah. Working, awesome. Yeah. I'm working on Weaver with her. I'm doing Call the Ravens Home with Garrett Gunn, which I'm extremely excited about that title. And then uh, I did Get in the Game, and one of the guys from Get in the Game is going to submit to you guys. <laughs> It's going to be okay. called Lab Rat. It's going to be in our warehouse in like two to three weeks. Yeah. And then um, I'm doing four titles that I cannot talk about right now um, for NCA purposes. And then another. I'm doing some stuff I can't talk about too. Two Dirk Manning titles that are also can't talk about yet. <laughs> busy, busy. Very busy. That's awesome. Oh, you Dirk, are what a talk. Are I'm in in my opinion, one of the names in the industry for for editing um, creator of comics. Thank you. So it's been um, a long time, yeah. I've I've been in this industry for a long, long time. So 
to like actually hear anybody say that is like really <laughs> thank you <laughs> totally people I, are seeking you out because they 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 want you specifically it's pretty exciting same goes for she's you. awesome to work with too i mean i like i feel like the people that i work with um like except for justin uh <laughs> i like to consider like my friends and that yeah. i can like talk to like not just like about the project but you know we you know we kind of talk about everything except I Justin. threaten him regularly on a daily basis. Yeah. <laughs> and he laughs it off because he's just like if you can reach my neck you can strangle it. <laughs> yeah. Right um, now luckily there's no conventions going on right now. Right, right. Yeah, less less in person, less chances for strangling. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure, Bob, when, when we finally have another con together, I'm probably going to like punch you and then hug you and then buy you a drink and then yell yep. at you much. I don't know. This is a roller coaster. We got to get out of our systems. Right. I'm in. It'll be a year, won't it? Like it'll be from Chicago to Chicago, I think. <sighs> wow. Weird. Maybe. It's crazy. Nice. I'm hoping. Um, Awesome. We have to wrap it up. Do you guys want to tell everybody where they can find you online so they can see all the cool stuff you're doing and working on and ask you more questions about Broken Gargoyles? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, hopefully you can go to comic shops and find my comics there. Uh, if not, you can go to SourcePoint Press's uh, online store, which is oximedia.com. And if you click on comics, uh, you can punch in Bob Sally and you'll see all the stuff that I'm working on. I got odors, salvagers, uh, broken gargoyles, and uh, hopefully some more stuff coming soon that uh, I'm not going to talk about because that seems like what we're not doing, talking about things. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all my stuff's there. And if you go on Facebook, uh, look up Bob Sally. If you find my dad, say hi and then find me. And uh, I even put my, uh, what is it? how do I do it? Nope, that way. That right way. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, say hi. I'll probably get free stuff. Drina, where can they find you? Huh? Where can they find you? Oh, Drina Joe. That's, I don't, that's okay. accurate. I think if they search yeah, it, I, I don't think know if there's anybody else named Drina Joe out there. Your Instagram. Right? <laughs> Justin, you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yep, you can find me on Twitter at Justin Birch. You can follow me on Instagram at Justin underscore Birch underscore letters. Um, that's where I'm at. And real quick, I would just like to say that everyone out there watching, you should pick this book up because it's one of the few books that I've worked on where every aspect of the book complements each other from the writing all the way down to the logo design by Rich Bloom. Rich designed that logo, correct? Yeah, yeah he did, yeah. yeah. So quick, quick shout out to Rich. Yeah. Well, thank Let's you. Get this book. Buy this book. <laughs> cool. And then uh, SourcePoint uh, is at SourcePoint Press on Facebook and Instagram, and then at SourcePT Press on Twitter. And then you can find me at Joshua Frantic on everything. Um, so thank you so much for having us, John. I think that's pretty much concluding Broken Gargoyles. Man, you guys are awesome. I dropped as many links as I could possibly find. There's a ton of great content out there from SourcePoint Press. And thank you guys. That was that was killer. And I'm super pumped to, to read this. I want to say right thank you to Derek Sterling for uh, his comments and everything and always uh, supporting us and uh, following along. Man, yeah. I think you bought four variants in, this, in that one show. <laughs> <laughs> sure. All right. So thank you guys. And uh, good luck with this book. Thank you very much, John. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. I want to remind you all that we are Mainframe Comic Con. Uh, you can go to the website, mainframecomiccon.com, and get the breakdown of the schedule, what is happening across this weekend. It is a busy, busy weekend. There are five, count them, five different halls running all weekend. So right now, you could jump over and check out any number of different things going on. My hall, this is Hall D here on the Whitewell Comics channel. We've got uh, David Pepos coming in here. We've got a new panel starting up in the next 20 minutes. So for right now, we're going to take a little bit of a break. And you hang out here with us because at the half hour mark, we're going to start panel number three here at Hall D. Thank you folks for hanging with us.
Yo, friends, we are back at the Mainframe Comic Con. You can go to the website, mainframecomiccon.com, for all the different panels, but you don't want to leave right now. You don't want to leave because we got more great indie comic discussions this morning here in Hall D. I want to remind you all that this is free because of the Hero Initiative, and dang it, if my man uh, Simon R. doesn't know what that's all about. He did a $10 super chat to say thank you for all the great panels. He knows that the money that you super chat is going to the Hero Initiative. But better than that, if you go to mainframecomiccon.com, you can donate directly. No YouTube taking 20% or whatever. You go straight there. You can donate to the Hero Initiative, which is making all of this possible, all these great panels across five YouTube channels. Right there at the Mainframe website, you can find all the different things. Click and go to the, any shows that you want when this one is done because right now we got a very special panel i will say as someone who works behind the scenes with the hero initiative and this comic-con here at mainframe these two gentlemen made a huge impact on why mainframe worked the first time around and they're back to do the same with us this time around we are doing a special spotlight this time around here on mr rylan grant and we got a host with the most Mr. David Pepos, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. Uh, uh, thanks so much for having me back for Mainframe. I'm excited to to, to talk up my pal Rylan, and uh, yeah, this is this is gonna be fun. Uh, we're gonna really we're gonna trade some war stories. We're gonna get into the nitty gritty of making comics, and uh, maybe we'll even talk a little bit about uh, what Rylan's working on right now. Sounds perfect. Sounds awesome. I'm gonna be hanging backstage, reminding people that if they leave comments, they have questions for these guys. I can bring those comments on, and these guys can answer them for you. If you super chat your questions, it makes it easier to see them as well. Sounds but great. I'm gonna hide out backstage because I'm gonna let you introduce the man. All right. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know the man, the myth, the legend, um, this person who I'm about to introduce is a two-time Blacklist uh, 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 recipient. Uh, he's also a Ringo Award winner uh, for his Best Villain for his work on Aberrant. Uh, he's also the writer of Banjax and the recent successful Kickstarter, The Jump. So I'm really excited to introduce uh, my pal, uh, writer Rylan Grant. How you doing, man? Rylan, how you doing, buddy? Good to see you. I'm doing well. I'm still recovering from all the intros. I feel like there was so much pageantry. Like the countdown, you know, was like I felt like we were going into space. That's how I felt. I was. I, yeah. I said this was, feels very tense. I, I hope we can we can pull this off. Yeah, yeah um, and there was that awesome like graphic video intro, and then yeah, and uh, you did a good job. You know, sort of set me up. So let's. I, let's, I uh, try. I try. Yeah. So uh, first off, you know, uh, I, I guess we'll just start with kind of the easy things. You know, I mean, first off. You know what got you into comics, Rylan? Like, you know, what what, what got you here? Oh, God, yeah. Um, how to make that not a marathon of a story? Um, yeah, you know, comics were were always my my first love. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, I fell in love with comics. I don't know how old I was. I need to kind of look back and pin down how old I was. But I, I used to. Uh, my mom used to be in a bowling league. And um, I would, uh, you know, I'd get brought to the bowling alley with her and I'd usually play video games, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Turtles in Time or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a comic shop opened in the pro shop of the bowling alley. And, um, and a, uh, a very, uh, uh, very nice, very savvy comic owner gave me a copy of Reed Fleming, The World's Toughest Milkman. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read it, uh, but it is... Not. Yeah, I, you should pick it up. It's you know kind of a, a brilliant you know indie comic from the um, I, I want to say the late eighties, mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe mid eighties um, about this kind of just like piss and vinegar milkman who um, you know who is drunk all the time and gets into misadventures and uh, yeah the um, so this uh, was a formative I, you know, text for you. It was a formative text for me. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it, you know it, it gave birth to most of my uh, most of the you know the personality I display now. The, uh, <laughs> The one you know and love. Um, yeah, and then there was, um, you know, and then I got sucked into kind of comic shops um, uh, proper. Um, I was kind of one of the rubes that was drawn in by uh, the death of Superman, mm -hmm. you know, and that whole big event, you know, got to yep. come check this out, what everybody's Same talking here. about. Yeah, but lucky for me, kind of, um, you know, the image revolution was happening back then and, mm -hmm. and comics were changing and you were starting to see like, you know, they weren't just these kind of like watered down morality plays. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you could do something, you could do things that were different, things that were kind of edgy. 
Um, and really what kind of solidified things for me was like, I sort of started, you know, back then diving, uh, 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 back issue bin diving. And, um, you know, some of the stuff that, uh, I mean, Marvel was doing even in the, um, God, even in like the late seventies, you know, I'm thinking of like the, the demon, you know, in a bottle arc, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, from Iron Man, um, that stuff really, um, you know, just show me what comics could be. Right. Um, I mean, it's like they made you know, you could deal with real deal human issues, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, these more kind of universal issues. I mean, they, they made one of their A-listers an alcoholic in the 70s that was like unheard of. Right. Um, and then I feel like, uh, I mean, you know, some of my, my favorite creators, the uh, the guys that kind of really influenced me now, the Garth Ennis's and Brian Azzarello's, um, they kind of, uh, you know, like, if Garth Ennis and, uh, and Ezrello, if they were kind of Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, then like, you know, uh, uh, you know, that, that seventies Marvel stuff was, you know, the doors and, um, uh, you know, bands like that. So, um, you know, I guess that that's my lineage. Yeah. So, and then you went on to film, um, you know, you, you went yeah. to film school, you, you became a working screenwriter. You've worked with, um, you know, people like, uh, like Justin Lin and, and Luke Besson, I believe you'd said at one point. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, J.J. Abrams, Ridley Scott, Justin Lin, John Woo, uh, yeah, Luke Besson, F. Gary Gray. I, uh, I get paid now to write, um, kind of very big, kind of popcorn-y action movies. Um, not what I, not what I started out doing, you know, cause, cause again, comics were my first love and I actually tried to, uh, I tried to get into comics when I was in college. Mm -hmm. but it was so hard to do back then. You guys get to know an artist like in your town. Right. Um, you're dealing with physical drawings and, you know, now it's so much easier. Like five years ago, it got crazy easier with uh, digital workflow and, you know, these uh, huge with international Facebook artists. groups. And, yeah, exactly. And so, um, uh, but, um, so yeah, so I had to settle for, uh, for film. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I um, uh, it was at the University of Michigan, uh, triple major in film, dramatic writing and art history, um, got into mm -hmm. the American Film Institute Conservatory, which, which is where, you know, David Lynch and uh, and Terrence Malick and Darren Aronofsky went um, and uh, and yeah I got hired um, uh, about halfway through AFI to write my first script for uh, for Luke Besson did wow. a couple of things for him and then kind of uh, you know yeah I've been writing you know in Hollywood for God about fifteen years since then. Um, so t tell us a little bit about how you made that leap back from film to comics. Um, you know, I, I, you were, you were a member of the, the meltdown crew, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, for those, for the uninitiated meltdown comics is kind of this, um, you know, I don't know what you call it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's an iconic comic shop, I guess it is. It is no longer, uh, around unfortunately and in fact did you see the building just uh just caught fire yeah uh, yeah it's just it was just it was last week i think yeah it was like watching um like my my childhood house you know burned down or something right. like that it was like it was like tear in my eye and stuff like that and, and so weird that i'm watching it on instagram you know yeah um uh yeah so um you know comics never uh, they never left me you know um i mean i was reading constantly and still in love with the medium and um and um, you know, it, it it coincided interest interestingly with how the um, how the town, meaning Hollywood, is changing. How, how sure. the business of screenwriting was changing. Um, so when I started, you know, when I started as a screenwriter, you you wrote a spec script, meaning that you wrote a script that you weren't getting paid to write, and if it was good, you sold it for a bunch of money, and then you moved on to the next one. Sure. Um, that was just how the business worked. And uh, and well, it, it, you know, then after a couple of years that stopped happening. You kind of couldn't sell anything as a, as a, as a pitch or, a, um, as a, as a script anymore. I had a few lean years and, um, what happened was, um, the, uh, uh, this age of IP, uh, came upon us, right? Like everything had to be, uh, everything in Hollywood had to be based on something, whether it was a, uh, a novel, a short story, a video game, a comic book, whatever. Um, and so, uh, and so quite necessarily, uh, my business at some point a few years into my career became IP. Um, couldn't sell anything to save my life. And then finally I kind of wised up and I'm like, you know what, if they want IP, um, let's give them IP. And so I took this idea that I had for a movie that I knew I couldn't sell as a spec or a, or a script uh, or a, a pitch. And I wrote it as a short story, um, got the short story published. And then overnight we had a bidding war. We had, uh, you know, we had, um, Justin Lin on one side coming off, uh, the Fast Six opening, which was the largest opening in Universal summer history at that point, might still be. Um, and then we had um, uh, Brett Ratner and Robert De Niro on the other side, and uh, and wow. you know we had 
bunch of people. Tyler Perry was bidding, which would have been awesome. <laughs> um, any number of things. And so, uh, so I kind of hacked the system. And so, um, so at that point I was, um, I was in an IP mindset anyway. It was, um, you know, at that point, what I realized, the, the big lesson I took from that was that, okay, you couldn't just be a screenwriter anymore. You had to be a writer, a writer of things, a storyteller. Sure. Um, you had, you had to, you had your story, you tell it in the best way that you can, and then it would kind of live on to become other things and right. mutate into other. Um, and so I was already sort of thinking that way, and then, and then, you know, um, and then that coincided with again the the process of making comics becoming so much easier. I mean, we've, we've had almost like a, a, a 50 year jump in 10 years here. Right. Right. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, again, digital workflow and, you know, you have these massive uh, Facebook groups now uh, like connecting comic book writers and artists where, you know, it's, it's 26,000 members and it's all, it's people like you and me and, and, and great artists. And so cut to a few years later, um, you know, I have artists working for me in, uh, in Hungary and Mexico and Brazil and Portugal. Um, my go-to colorist is in Indonesia. My letterer is in, um, uh, the UK. I pay them all via PayPal. We communicate almost exclusively via email. Um, and so, uh, and so it just making comics became possible. It was what I always wanted to do. Um, and yeah, like you said, um, so I, I needed to figure out how to do it. Right. Um, yeah. uh, and, um, and, you know, panels and cons like this really helped. But, um, but what I found was I, I found this comic book home at Meltdown Comics at, at, at my, my local comic shop. And, um, and there was just a community there, of people that kind of met every week and, um, and you know, sort of, a, um, uh, you know, all kind of organized by this, uh, this kind of iconic, uh, uh, you know, comic teacher figure named Jim Higgins, who I, I suggest uh, if you're looking to uh, get into, you know, the business of comics, figure out how to write your comics, Jim Higgins is a, a really great um, uh, our resource, the Jim Higgins College of Comics. Um, and so, yeah, I met, uh, I met a lot of people there at Meltdown. Uh, uh, Carla Nappi, who, uh, who's doing Duplicate now, is just about to be released. Stephen Prince, who did Monster Matador. And um, yeah, I'm trying to think, um, uh, you know, just a, just a whole list of people. And then, you know, and then from, from there on, everybody knows everybody and, and you kind of start walking in. Yeah, it was like, Meltdown was a great place. I mean, I miss it so much. It was sort of like this- um, Talent incubator in a way. Yeah. And like, you know, community center is one thing, but it was almost like the center of, it, it was one of the epicenters of the comic universe for a really long time. It's just, yeah. uh, you, you just never knew who was going to be in there. And, you know, you're, you're, you're sitting there with your comic group and then fucking whatever Matt Fraction sits down at the table and starts talking comics for an hour. Um, really kind of surreal place. And, 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 and it's weird because it, it, it is, you know, I mean, Hollywood is very much like that. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm eating, I'm having lunch at Barney's Greengrass and I sit down and Billy D. Williams is over my shoulder and then I get up to go to the bathroom and I almost run into a, you know, I, I run smack dab in Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, that actually happened in, in one day over the course of about 45 minutes. Um, LA is this weird, magical, crazy fucking place with this stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's a lot of comic stuff going on. So also. can, can tell us a little bit about, uh, tell us about your experience with your first comic, um, which, uh, you know, aberrant. Um, over at Action Lab, you know, what was the experience of going about pitching that? What was your, you know, what was the learning curve for you in terms of hitting the ground running as far as your first indie comic was concerned? Yeah, well, it, there definitely is a learning curve. Um, I was lucky in that, um, you know, again, I had been at that point, I had been a working screenwriter in Hollywood for a dozen years or so, and so, um, so the idea of like selling yourself and selling your story. Um, you know, boiling down the stuff that you're good at, boiling down your idea into a couple of lines, your elevator pitch, um, uh, knowing what to say and what not to say, knowing, uh, um, you know, all of that, um, I was already practiced, right? Um, and that, and I very much think that all of those things that I just talked about are, um, you know, this is a trade. And sure. a lot of people think a lot of people think it's just about what you put on the page, and right. that's a huge part of it. You have to you have to learn how to write one of these things. I mean, it's um there are a lot of people that come to me and they're like, okay, well, um, you know, uh, you have any screenwriting tips? And it's like, well, really, all you can do is just write and then write and then write and then write and then write and mm -hmm. um and and you know, there are books that help with structure and everything, um, but you can't really you can't really grasp this stuff until you implement it, right? 
yeah, until you put it into practice. Doing. It's it, it's it's about it's it's like any other trade. It's about getting your ten thousand reps in, right? Yeah. Um. And so you know, you write your first script and it sucks, and you write your second script and it's a little better, and maybe your fifth script ends up being something that's worth looking at. Yeah. That's the rule for everybody. And I and 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 I am I am now on script. I couldn't even wager a guess. You know, like five thousand. I maybe maybe that's uh maybe that's uh hyperbolic a little bit, but not much. Um. I think in three acts now, right? And right. so, uh, and so the stuff kind of comes out of me. So that was a huge advantage, I think. If like you know, again, because I I made my first book, and you know, again, uh, I mean, it was my first book. I was still figuring out how to do this, and so I made mistakes like anyone else. But it was it was received very well. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, you know, at least a dozen critics, ten best lists, was nominated for two Ringos, won another one, um, and so it it went pretty well. Um, it wouldn't have gone that well if I hadn't. There's so much to learn when you're getting into comics, you know. And um, and, and I think that's the biggest thing is like, um, you can write the best book in the world, but no, it may be that nobody ever sees it, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, because you are not. Um, I still had to while while I could talk about my well, I could write a good book, while I could talk about my book, I could pitch my book. Um, I needed to learn how to get my book into uh, publishers' hands. I needed to learn how to um convince uh uh you know uh editors of comic sites and and reviewers to um take an indie book seriously and make it worth their time i mean these people are um i mean you, you were a reviewer for a really really long time yeah. uh your time your time is finite um right. you have eight, you have eight million people asking you to review their books right it's like um, a fire hose i mean it, it, yeah, you know you yeah. it, exactly there's a limited amount of time and a limited amount of bodies that you can throw at this stuff yeah, and so how do you how do you stand out? How do you make it worth their while? How do you you know when when it's your book or one of twenty five others or fifty others yeah. at that moment? How, how do you get you know how do you get in there? And um, and you know I was lucky in that I did a lot of groundwork uh, before before I got into this thing. I spent you know I, I mean I was always going to comic cons and I was always active, but I spent a good like year or two on the comic circuit before I My oh, back. There. Yep, you're back. back. You're back. We're back. So you spent a, a year or two on the comic circuit and then what? Oh, there you are. All right. Did, did you lose me for a second there? I did. I did. Just for a yeah. second. One okay. of us froze. Okay. One of us froze. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So I guess I was saying that, you know, I spent, spent a good year or two, um, you know, on the comic circuit before then. And, uh, and, and that was formative. I mean, I, I had my meltdown crew that was great, but, um, you know, I also met other guys like you and David Schrader and Charlie Stickney and, and all of these guys who, um, uh, who all had different skill sets and different things to teach me. And I guess if that's the, um, I guess that that's the thing that we continue to do as a group, we found this nice group of comic creators and it, yeah. it builds out every year. Um, and, you know, in fact, uh, it's, you know, kind of the gift we've given to mainframe comic con is that almost, uh, you know, uh, almost all of these creator, pa creator panels are staffed by, uh, our, you know, sort of our, our LA crew. Yeah. Our, L well, you know, not just our LA crew. I mean, because that, that's, you know, we've been to so many different cons now that that's, uh, that's built out, um, yeah. a little bit, but, but yeah, I mean, our, our, our little crew, we need a name. I don't know what the name of our crew is, but, um, uh, but we've all learned from each other. We've all helped each other. And, um, and it's, um. Yeah, I mean, it was like I remember, you know, I remember, uh, you know, our first calls. Like we're, yeah. you know, we thought, uh, um, and, we and I just for an thought, hour and a half. Yeah, okay. and I picked. Yeah, and you had been around the block. I mean, you had you had already kind of take. You had already uh, Spencer and Locke was at that point really well received, and and you had done it with Action Lab, which was uh, fortuitous for me. Um, and you had been around the block and also you were coming from a really interesting place because again, you had been a, a journalist and a reviewer for so long. And right. so, um, so, uh, in terms of that, you know, sort of side of things, I could be like, okay, well, you know, what are the do's? What are the don'ts? What do you, you know, what do you hate when receiving things? What do you, um, yeah. and so, so if I didn't have all of these friends that were kind of, I don't know, propping me up and holding my hand through, uh, through this, this right. thing, then, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe five people would have read the book and I never would have ended up, you know, uh, with the reviews I did and which, sure. you know, the Ringo nominations and the, and uh, the Ringo's up there somewhere, but, um, but all that stuff. And so it's, um, 
it's a great it's a great TED. I mean, I, you know, I guess it's a it's a long winded way of saying like um, you're only as good as kind of the people you run with. Sure. You know, you need sure. a little help from your friends in this in this thing. So I, I think that's my my big what, lesson. What do you think in terms of um, between your work in screen screenwriting and your work in putting together comics? What do you think was sort of the biggest culture shift for you, or was there anything particularly in the mechanics of it all that was uh, uh, the the most learning curve in, in, in terms of putting together a comic? Yeah, well, it's it's a it's it's a weird question for me because um, I mean it's a good question, but I'm saying it's a, it's a weird question for me to answer because um, right. I mean, if you notice if you notice um, in all of my books, I give myself a uh, you maybe or may not be able to see this. I give myself a writer director credit, <laughs> which pisses a lot of comic people off. Uh, but you know, screw them. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna do me. Um, you know, I, I I mean, I have for whatever it's worth, I have a master's in 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 directing from the American Film Institute Conservatory, which. Um, you know, is I think valuable in a way, you know, uh, again, I mean, I spent, I spent two and a half years, um, you know, at the, the best place in the world to learn visual storytelling. Um, and so I've always, I've always treated these things just like little films I'm directing. Um, and that, that's a different way of approaching it to a certain mm -hmm. degree, but, but, but kind of not. And so, um, so I guess, you know, I mean, some could argue that, um, some could argue that, I haven't changed enough, <laughs> you know, to, to suit the medium. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, in anything, you, you kind of want your own style, you want your own signature. And it's like, um, it was the, um, you know, Aberrant was, um, Aberrant was very quickly, I think uh, two weeks before the, um, the first, the second issue hit uh, comic shops, it was optioned for television by Tony Krantz, who did uh, 24 and Felicity and, um, uh, uh, he's doing Wu Assassins at Netflix now, uh, produce, produce Mulholland Drive for David Lynch. And, um, and he just, he read the first issue and he said, man, it just felt like a, it just felt like I was watching a TV series immediately. You know, the, uh, right off the bat, page one, there are musical cues, you know, uh, uh, Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy just comes right in and you're seeing the lyrics and you're kind of seeing the musical notes dance across the page. Um, and, um, and you're hearing that while you're reading it, right? And then this kind of, I think there are five songs in the first issue and this soundtrack, almost like you'd see in a, a good 80s action movie, just kind of uh, uh, carries, you, carries you on through. And, you know, all of my books, I think are very heavily uh, um, uh, influenced more by um, the things I watched growing up, kind of, you know, I, I, I had a weird upbringing and so the television kind of raised me and that was where I learned right and wrong. And that was where all my style and all my, you know, vernacular and everything comes from. Uh, so that shit is just oozing in these, in, in these books. And so, you know, um, so if anything, I've refused to adjust and I think that it has kind of given me a signature style. And I think that's why people like reading these comics. The people tell, who do like reading. Them. Tell us more about these eighties influences, uh, for, from, from, from the TV that raised you. What, what, what are you, what are you, what are you drawing from that? What, what, what was some of the stuff? What, what are your North stars creatively? My North Stars, oh God, uh, I mean, there are uh, so many. So, so you know, the the I get paid to write, again, big action movies, right? And yeah. so uh, there are big action movies that um, uh, that influence me. Um, I mean, right off the bat, I think Aberrant, you know, kind of begins with a, uh, you know, it's a military unit and a helicopter. It's kind of a, a, a predator uh, a mm -hmm. vibe. You know, those, uh, the, those Shane Black movies, Lethal Weapon. Um, I mean, I... I, I like stuff that has um, the stuff that really influences me is something that walks the line. Those action comedies, uh, Beverly Hills Cop, uh, Beverly Hills Cop Two, which I think is actually the superior movie. Um, uh, Forty Eight Hours was a great one. Uh, Midnight Run, you know, again, action comedy levity. Um, uh, those are just some of my you know absolute favorite movies. Um, Banjax, uh, Banjax, which is kind of a vigilante movie, and there's you look under it, and it's you know it's kind of Death Wish with a superhero. Right. Um, there is a uh, on page two. There is a Cobra reference. Mm -hmm. uh, the the um, the Sylvester Stallone classic from the uh, the eighties, uh, which actually spun off from Beverly Hills Cop, which is kind of an interesting story. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, if John's listening, are we going a half hour here? Or are we going a uh, 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 an hour? Um, hey, sorry. <laughs> you guys yeah. have as much time as you want. I think three o'clock Eastern is the next uh, oh. Hall D uh, guest, but you know we can run schedules in between and things. So I just want you guys to have a great time. This has been hilarious. I think you guys are amazing. 
And uh, cool. I saw Tahoe J. Bennett had a cool question about yeah. starter I, uh, ideas and such. Well, that, that was actually, that was going to be my next question, which is, um, you know, us talking about your, your, your latest book, The Jump, um, because yeah. you, you went to Kickstarter with that. And I wanted to ask, sort of, you know, how, you know, what was the shift um, from the direct market to Kickstarter? Uh, what kind of research did you have to do? Um, you know, what was your experience doing it? And selfishly, since I'm launching my own Kickstarter on Monday, uh, what advice do you have for me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and let's make sure we we, we plug that uh, uh, good and, uh, and and plenty in a minute. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that you and you know, and I'm interested. I shouldn't be the only one talking here because you just made the same decision I did, and I think that you partially made it because you saw people like me doing it and, yeah. and then it then it made sense to you. Um, so, uh, you know, the comic book industry has been decimated by by this whole whole COVID crisis, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, comic shops closed. Are for, yeah, comic shops closed for a long time. Diamond uh, 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 shuttered for a bit. You know, people are changing distributors. Uh, it was pencils down everywhere for a good long time. Um, they're uh, obviously like, you know, Obviously, the pub the publishers are in in a lot of trouble. I mean, we we've, we've seen uh, uh you know firings and CEOs being ousted and uh, and um, and there is um I mean the funny thing about this con um, I'm doing other panels, but all the yeah. stuff that we all know but we can't talk about publicly is sure. you know again like like I mean the industry is on fire, and so to bring it back to me, um, you know I. Uh, I was in a groove after, you know, so Aberrant comes out and it was, it, it was received well, uh, two Ringo noms and a, uh, and, and, and one a Ringo and then Banjax hits and it's on, you know, a dozen critics, uh, 10 best lists and, 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 you know, is, is in the Ringo mix this go around. Um, I was, I had some heat, right. And, uh, and, and there were a lot of people that, I mean, the funny thing was, was watching at the Baltimore comic con, there were all these publishers that kind of, weren't interested before and then uh and then i you know like the day before and then i go to the ringo ceremony and i win one and i come back with one and then then the very next day i have publishers actually coming up to me and saying hey what do you got hey what do you got and so it was it, you know it was a it was a day at the buffet for for a little bit there um uh and um and so i had a lot of opportunities and um you know i actually had uh you know i i have five books in the pipeline right now so there's kind of starting to pile up um, a lot of other titles coming from Rylan Grant in the near future, hopefully, uh, hopefully nearer than, uh, than, than not. Um, and I had two books that were, that looked to be pretty well set with, you know, bigger time publishers. Um, and then COVID hits and then pencils down hit. And, uh, and, and, and that was amid these publishers already kind of scaling back slates and all sure. this stuff. Um, and so the pause button got hit on a lot of stuff. I know that happened to yeah. you also. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I am still in this place where, you know, again, I, I was at one publisher and, um, it, it is a very good sign when you're dealing with the EIC yep. and they're ask they start to ask you scheduling questions and production questions and all that stuff. And you're basically trying to figure out how to do the book and when the book's going to get released. Yep. Um, and then, and then COVID hits pencils down and then, uh, and then said EIC gets furloughed and then said EIC gets let go permanently. Um, and that's happening all around. And so, you know, two books that I don't know if they're going to, I don't know if they're going to catch back on with those, uh, publishers be rescheduled. I, I don't know what I do know now is it's, it's kind of impossible to, to sure. set most anything up with a Go ahead. It's well, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, the things that you're saying is that people are scaling back and they're staggering things. I think that's really the thing that, that made me decide to go for Kickstarter is that, um, you know, I have two issues of my book, um, which is codenamed Project Saffron, we had those ready to go. I was I was already so invested in the book that I've written the whole thing, and we already had two issues completely finished. And talking with publishers who were interested in it, but saying, "Well, we wouldn't be able to publish it until end of you know 2022." Yeah. Um, you know, it gets to this point where you know you have to ask yourself, "Why are we waiting for permission?" Yeah. Um, you know, whereas Kickstarter for me is very empowering, you know, it's, it's sort of, you get to put your work out when you feel like it. There's, it, there's also not this kind of hard and fast, uh, month to month schedule. You can do it a little bit more seasonally. Um, and so you're able to kind of stagger out your work and self publish it and self distribute it, which I think for me anyway, has been a very valuable learning experience. 
Yeah, and it's, you know, we've talked a little bit here about how radically the comic business, you know, has has changed, has shifted, and, and whatever. I mean, uh, I was going to say the last couple of years, but um, I really mean, the last, last couple of months, months, obviously, it's, it, you know, j- just today, really, uh, even. But, um, but yeah, there there used to be a stigma to kind of self-publishing and Kickstarter and yes. all these things, but but that stigma is is very much, um, it's very much vanished, and it's vanished yes. quickly. Um, and so, I mean, the first thing I'll say is that, um, you know, so, so I, I just took my lead from, there are a lot of people that did this before us. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie. You know, Charlie Stickney and, and, and Clay Adams and, uh, and, um, and Carla. Uh, David Avalone. Yeah. David Avalone and, and, and yeah, Carla went before us and, um, uh, and, um, and I was just amazed by what they did you know, uh, uh, via Kickstarter and, and these, these followings they built. I mean, it was like, um, you know, Charlie's done uh, five or six campaigns now. And, you know, I think he started out with 300 backers and $12,000 or something like that. And then mm-hmm. his last campaign, he had 11, 1200 backers and 30 plus thousand dollars. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and, and he kind of has this very, rabid fan base that is just waiting for them to put something new out and they're so excited and enthusiastic about it and they want to promote it and they want to tell their friends about it. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and then after Charlie did the Kickstarter thing, he took his book and he took it to scout comics and, um, and got it, you know, a, a traditional release there and in, in comic shops and scout comics is a really great outfit. And, um, and Scott Comics loved the book so much, and they loved Charlie so much, and they loved what Charlie was doing on Kickstarter so much that they made Charlie co-publisher. So, yeah. um, so I mean, they, that's that's an incredible story um, and, and, and really interesting. Uh, but um, I just saw the possibility there. I mean, here's the thing. is like, obviously, um, obviously the, the comic shop model right now, the traditional publishing model is very problematic. Sure. Um, and it has been problematic for a while, and we have chosen to ignore it because we were so nostalgic about it. Sure. Um, you and I were already waxing poetic about our our, uh, our our days spent in a comic shop, you know, when we were kids. Um, but things have to change, and yeah. and uh, uh, but I'm saying that uh, knowing full well and, and and owning the fact that you know we need to comic shops are important and and publishers are important and and, and we need to fight to save those things. But the only way we're going to save those things is if things change and shift. But um, right. But uh, right. there is this other thing happening. And Kickstarter is part of it, where there is this um, this self publishing boom, and um, it's almost like uh, it's a completely different audience. Sure. And I think as a, as a creator, uh, it's irresponsible not to service both audiences. And yep. and it used to be that, it used to be that you couldn't, or it was very difficult to and problematic to. Now, if you don't, it's a huge hole in your game. Right? Yeah, I mean that was the thing that convinced me was um, it was either it was either Charlie Stickney or, or, or Russell Nahelty who's got sort of a a, a, a yeah. laundry list of Kickstarter projects, and they were yeah, telling Russell's me um, that comics you know there are some people who just buy their books from a comic shop, and there are some people that just buy their books on Amazon or Comicsology. There are some people that only buy their books at conventions, which obviously you know we're not doing those anymore. Um, and then there's the people who buy their books on Kickstarter. And so why wouldn't you try to fit that into your game um, for the people who wouldn't be exposed to your work in any other way? Um, I mean, it's something that you did that I thought was particularly interesting. That uh, that was sort of a page that I stole from my playbook is every tier that you did, you also included the first issues of your other books. Yeah. Um, just to sort of, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very smart idea to sort of, hey, if you like the jump, let me get you interested in these other two books that I've done that have been well received and that there are a number of issues behind it. So if you yeah. like it, you can go out and, and buy it. Um, yeah, go to your local comic shop, go to yeah, yeah. comic Psychology, go to Amazon and check it out. Yeah. Was there anything particularly unexpected about, about Kickstarter that, you know, you had to pick up on the fly? Particularly unexpected. I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's so much, um, you know, it is a. You, you talk about you talk about your reps. You talk about ha- having a skill set. There is a Kickstarter right. skill set, and and it seems like with every every sort of tier of uh, of Kickstarter, there is yeah. kind of new things to learn. Um, you know, so first of all, you have to learn the Kickstarter interface. It's like you know, I mean, if you're playing a new video game and you need yeah. to learn how the controls work and learn all the moves and learn the the stages backwards and forwards and all that, you got to learn all of that stuff, right? Um, and you have to learn how to 
it's kind of you're running a political campaign, yeah. right? And so you have to learn how to um, you have to learn how to run a successful campaign. And and you and I were lucky in that we had all of these people who had kind of done this before us. And so right. I think that I mean, if there was anything I you know all, all I did was you know I just Charlie Russell Avalone all these guys I just you know I I stole everything from them. I didn't have <laughs> an original thought. Uh, maybe one or two, but, uh, but, but, but very, uh, uh, very few. Um, and so, um, and so, you know, then you do that and then, um, and then you have to, so, so you run a successful campaign, uh, and then, then you got to fulfill and, and then you got to learn backer kit. Right. And, 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 and the thing is like, you can, uh, if you want to get your other books into people's hands, backer kit is a huge tool, right? And so, um, and so you gotta you gotta build a backer kit shop, and you gotta learn how to 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 build your backer kit and market your backer kit, and and the best backer kit practices, and uh, and how to interact with people on backer kit, and how to bring more people in via back, backer kit, and then um, and then you have to you know, and then you actually have to ship this thing, right? You need to learn where to get your supplies and what supplies you need, and the best place to get postage, and uh, and how to how to sort through the logistics of mailing, um, you know, 300 packages, yep. uh, you know, when we're, when the USPS is on fire now. Yeah. Um, I, I still don't know how I'm going to do that. Um, and so, so, you know, again, there's just something around every corner and, and, and what I suspect, I haven't done this yet. I'm still in the middle of kind of fulfilling my first campaign is that, um, you know, the next go round, the infrastructure is going to be built. I'll have done it before. There's going to be a lot of copying and pasting with backer kit. There's a lot of stuff that just transfers over naturally. Right. And it'll, it'll be, it'll get easier every time. I mean, the caveat is that, well, you get more backers next time. Right. Uh, usually. And, and, and hopefully. And so, um, you know, I remember Charlie, uh, uh, you know, I remember congratulating Charlie on his last campaign when he had 11 plus hundred backers. And, um, and, and he's like, yeah, you know, uh, it was great, but you know, now, now I got to mail out all these packages. He's like, <laughs> he's like, he's like, I figured it out. If I do like, if I do like 33 a day, it's still going to take me well over a month. So, yeah, you know, I mean, that's, uh, and, and, and Charlie has kids and a job. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, so there's all that. I mean, the, 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 it's, um, that's what is surprising. It's like, it's great to, you know, you and I can get on and we can talk and we can promote and and yeah. and, and, and and we love getting people interested in our uh, our, our stuff. Um, uh, that's always great. But um, yeah, just the uh, th that is the you know we have always had companies that have shipped our books out for us and have done kind of the that the sort distribution of, thing. Yeah, yeah, that grunt work stuff. And now it's just us, and 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 and, and that's going to be rough. I guess like the pleasant surprise was how um, was how interactive. A, uh, a a medium uh, Kickstarter is uh, uh, a platform Kickstarter is sure um, you, you know you you put books out in a comic shop and um, I mean we, we meet fans at cons and stuff like that and that's always great but at least um, we used to <laughs> yeah yeah you know what I'm saying it, it, and, and 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 I get hit up on Twitter and stuff like that but um but Kickstarter is like immediately interactive. You know what I'm saying? You send out an update and you get replies, you get interaction, you get comments, you get questions. Um, uh, if you, you know, if you wait too long to do something, you're going to hear about it from five people. If you do something wrong, you're going to hear about it from 25 people. If you do something great, you're going to hear about it from 25 people. Um, uh, and so um, how enthusiastic and engaged uh, uh, sure. the, the audience uh, was 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 a re was a real ple pleasant surprise, and so um, you know, I think you saw it. I mean, you kind of dissected my campaign when you were building yours. Yes. Um, I tried very hard with the jump to to make it as interactive an experience as possible. Um, uh, you know, I wanted I wanted people weighing in on things. Okay, well, which cover should I go with? And you know, hey, do you guys like this idea? Do you like that idea? And then um, and then. Uh, any way I could involve them. Uh, you know, we had all these kind of interesting tiers where you could be drawn into the book where we could put your face on a cover. Uh, uh, you know, we had, um, uh, we had a tier where, um, I would, I would do a five page original story that takes place in the world of the jump starring you starring the backer. Yeah. Um, and that was interesting because we had, um, uh, somebody took us up on that which was a big deal. And, and, and it's been fun starting to kind of create that thing with this person. And then I immediately had two people take the larger, like $400 drawn tiers. Mm -hmm. And those are for the actual issue of, of the jump. Right. Um, and, and, and so I thought that, you know, um, 
I just assume, oh, wow, these people want to be drawn into the, the regular comic. And then they message me and they're like, no, our, it, it was our friend who bought the original story and we are paying for this drawn thing to be drawn into that original story. We want to be drawn oh. into the story that's for him. And so, you know, again, you, you, you see this thing start to sort of take shape and start to like, uh, uh, you know, have a life of its own, right? Yeah. Um, and and, and, and how, the, how the fan creator experience is just kind of changing and evolving and becoming cool and interesting and, yeah. You know, so much of comics is, is a collaborative experience. And I, you actually touched upon something that I, I wanted to get into. Um, mm. Because, you know, like you, you have people getting drawn into your book. And that's something that that you're going to work on with your artist. So can you talk a little bit about sort of the back and forth that you have with your with your collaborators and your books? Um, you know, uh, it, do, you, do you find it to be particularly similar to the way that you've worked with collaborators on your scripts? Or, um, you know, what's like... Tell, tell us a little bit about your process because I feel like that's so different from writer to writer and artist to artist. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. And uh, I mean, you have some insight into this uh, into this because you and I have done a panel at um, at, at cons a yeah. couple of times called called directing your comic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what we did it at we did it at San Diego Comic Con one time with with Sean Lewis who did yeah. uh, who has who has Bliss out now and who's yep. who's. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at this, at this con right now. Um, and I remember us doing it, uh, at LA comic con, um, on a 13 inch laptop, uh, because they didn't give us the audio visual, uh, audio video equipment that we needed. I remember that one. Uh, that was funny. Um, it's, it's visual aid heavy. So I had to kind of like call everybody in and be like, Hey, watch this on my laptop. That was a little, but it, but it was fun. Um, and good pictures from that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say, and it, it, the, the funny thing about the panel is, is that so the conceit of the panel is uh, that I cast the comic book creator as the director of, of his own book, his own movie, or, or her, of course. Uh, sure. In my case, it was it was his, um, and um, and I talk about how I how I communicate with an artist and my my collaborators, um, and then you you were there because you immediately kind of disagreed with me. You, <laughs> you, you, you took another way. You're like, no, for me, it's this. And, and, and it was interesting because it, it ended up being this kind of like compare and contrast between, yeah. you know, two creator styles of, of collaborating. And so that's what I'll say is like, you know, again, I, um, you know, I, I, I went to the, um, uh, you know, the American Film Institute Conservatory and trained as a, a film director. And, um, and so I do very much treat each and every issue that I do um, uh, as a little film that I'm directing. Now, you know, it might be different if I was, if I was doing a book for Boom, uh, it wouldn't be the case. I'd write a script uh, just like I do in Hollywood and I would turn it over and, you know, uh, there would be a, a very experienced seasoned uh, editor who would then take the reins and, uh, and, and guide the artists and the, the colorists and, and the letter and everything. But, um, you know, with my books, with Aberrant, uh, The Jump, Banjax, The Whole Nine Yards, um, you know, I, I have a very particular uh, uh, thing in mind when I'm creating the book. Um, and, uh, and so I try to kind of get that across on the page. So my scripts, um, uh, a lot of comics, it, it, there's no right way or wrong way or standard way to do a comic script, right? right. Um, but most of the comic scripts I, I see are very bare bones. Sure. Um, just simply, this is the action that, that, that's happening and, and here are a couple of lines of dialogue. And, and most people aspire to, well, if I can keep it down to like a sentence or two in terms of like the panel description, then, then that's ideal. Um, and you had a you lot know, of reference though. Tons of references, and so so you know, along with a way of saying that my scripts ends up end up being kind of part script and part director's notes. Yeah. So if I was preparing a film, everything that I would give to a um, everything that I would give to a cinematographer, to a production designer, to a costumer. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've prepped plenty of films, and uh, and 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 I like to give a lot of information and a lot of references to my you know big big visual books, look books. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so that, you know, that starts from the very beginning. I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about a new series with a collaborator, it's like, um, okay, well here are, um, you know, when, when I did the jump, I called it, um, uh, the, the film compare, again, I'm, I'm influenced by film, the film comparisons come easy. So I called, um, uh, uh the jump was a smart, high concept sci-fi thriller full of meaty twists and turns. It's inception meets the board identity. If it were dripping with macabre and directed by David Fincher. And so when Fabio, the artist and I, and, and Edson, the colorist, when we, when we just started talking about the thing, it was, um, uh, 
it, it was in the framework of those movies. Okay, here are a bunch of David Fincher uh, uh, references, film stills. Um, watch this, watch that. Um, that really influenced me. Um, uh, and so I want the book to look and feel in general like this. Um, and, you know, with The Born Identity, it's the way it, the, you know, the, the grittiness, the way it moves, all that stuff. Um, there's a book I'm working on uh, right now with David Leon Diaz, who is the guy who uh, drew most of Aberrant, um, uh, that is kind of a, you know, small town bank robbery stuff. And, um, and we spent a lot of time watching and then discussing Fargo and, uh, and Hell or High Water, mm-hmm. um, uh, bank robbery scenes in Heat from Michael Mann, stuff like that. And so, um, you know, just, I, I think references like that will, will get you right into, um, get you right into the frame of mind. You know, it, it'll get you into the right place to actually start to process the script. Right. right? And so, then, so then they're reading the scripts with those kind of lenses over their eyes. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so that becomes important. And then, um, you know, and then my scripts become very specific, you know, it's, it's, it's not just two lines of, of action. Like John's walking into a, uh, a, 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 a convenience store. It's, um, it's, uh, you know, the camera is here. It's a low angle. Uh, this is in the foreground. This is in the background. Uh, you know, um, John's wearing this, um, uh, you know, uh, it could be any convenience store sometimes, but sometimes I want it to be a specific convenience store. You know, uh, a lot of people laughed about the um, McDowell's reference in, yep. in Aberrant Issue 1 from Coming to America. Uh, and, you know, it was like we were going to have a restaurant in the background, and it's like, okay, well, you know, it, let's make it McDowell's instead. Right. Um, and, that's, you know, and then sometimes it's like, okay, well, let's make this an homage to this iconic shot, the Copacabana sequence from Goodfellas or, 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 or whatever. Um, you know, and then, and then, you know, a lot of times, like you said, the, my, my, my scripts are visual reference heavy. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I want this to smack of this Caravaggio painting here, here right. it is, you know, uh, I want the lighting to be like this and, 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 and we go through and it's like, and then when I work with my colorist, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing cause they'll go through and they'll kind of, um, they will go through and they will color the scene. Uh, and then I kind of approve colors and then we go through and there was a second round of kind of lighting the scene. Um, okay. uh, you know, and, and, and that was very important in, in Banjax, you know, Banjax is this kind of noir um, and, you know, I, I don't know, you can see that kind of the, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very expressionistic, uh, uh, lighting all the way through. Um, and so, you know, that was, um, you know, I, that stuff was, uh, it was important, you know, um, it was just, uh, I think that it's the difference between, it just ticked Banjax up a couple of notches. I think it ticks yeah. all the books up a couple of notches. And so it takes a little more time and, and some, some, you know, some colorists aren't going to be on board for that. Sure. Um, I try to be, uh, I try to be upfront right off the bat. Like, look, this is going to be the way it's going to, this is the way it's going to go. And in fact, I, I try to do a, a, I try to do a, um, a test page or two uh, or three with my, my collaborators before we do it, just so they know what the process is going to look like. And, sure. and we get to know each other and then we can kind of mutually decide if we want to move forward. Um, so, with all that said, um, I try to work with people who are pretty damn good at their jobs, right? And and so um, the first thing I say to everybody is, look, like I'm going to um, I'm going to be very particular and very specific about what I'm asking for. However, um, you know, I hired you because I respect the shit out of what you do. And so if you see a different way to do it, a better way to do it, um, uh, you know, come come convince me to do it that way. You know what I'm saying? Uh, l- let's, let's talk about it. And, um, and I would say that, um, you know, 95% of the times that an artist or a colorist says like, Hey, um, I think it's better this way. They're absolutely correct. Um, and, and, and I see it instantly, you know, so. So, uh, you know, I, I want to ask, cause I know we're, we're starting to get closer to the, to the hour mark. And, and so I want to, yeah. I, I want to ask, you know, I mean, first, what what's next for you? I mean, is there anything that you want to be doing in the industry that you haven't done yet? Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked about that that you want to start talking about? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good question, and then and then we need to make sure that we uh, we pimp your Kickstarter pretty hard because I'm excited about it. Um, Thank you. I'll hand it over to you. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I guess the first thing, uh, um, yeah, I, you know, um, it's weird because I mean, I I have this. Um, you know, I do have this pretty solid day job, you know, writing, you know, 
film and TV and and, and I've been looking, yeah, I mean, I, I've been lucky in that I've, I've I've remained busy throughout this whole thing. I was kind of commenced on two uh, paid writing gigs before this whole thing started, and so um, and so yeah, I, I mean, I'm lucky in that I can pick my spots. You know, um, I, I I'm not uh, you know I'm not looking to write just anything and everything, and 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 really, you know, I, I think that I'm most happy. Um, I'm most happy doing these kind of original uh, 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 stories, you know, uh, things that are kind of of my own, um, uh, you know, they, they spring from my brain. Um, as I said, I have, uh, you know, I have probably five things uh, uh, in the pipe um, and I am ready to find homes for them. So, uh, you know, if, if, if the publishers and the editors are out there looking, I, I have material and I have, uh, I have plenty of things I want to write. Um, uh, you know, I have, um, there is a book right now that is a um, kind of a modern take on a on a on a Japanese tokusatsu. Um, uh, tokusatsu for the uninitiated is kind of the Japanese sci-fi uh, action genre that includes you know things like Voltron and Power Rangers and uh, kaiju, the Godzilla films and stuff like that. Um, and so this thing is kind of a uh, Fast and the Furious meets Voltron uh, is, is kind of the short and sweet of it. Um, um, you know. Uh, you know, with kind of a, a family feel, almost like Boogie Nights, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I think it's a really good, really interesting thing. I mean, I, I sort of co-created it with um, uh, this guy, Brad Warner, who is a, a very um, uh, uh, storied uh, Zen author. He's, he's, uh, he's done a number of books, uh, the most popular of which uh, is a book called Hardcore Zen, if you're kind of interested in, you know, modern American Buddhism at all or meditation. It's a, it's a great book. But, um, you know, Zen, uh, I mean, Brad's sold hundreds of thousands of books, uh, uh, you know, um, in, in bookstores. Um, but you know, he's a comic nerd and, um, and, and most importantly, he worked in Japan for about a dozen years as a, uh, executive for, um, for the uh, company that makes Ultraman. Um, yeah. and you know, uh, you know, Brad's a little upset that, um, you know, uh, Tokusatsu doesn't get, it doesn't quite get its due here. I mean, there's, it, it has its own kind of like, you know, nerd following or, or that's very rabid and very interesting. Yeah. Um, but, um, it's, definitely, but it's, it get its, it's like a niche audience. I get it. Yeah. And so, and so our goal was to, uh, together bring the, um, uh, you know, bring, uh, uh, tokusatsu to the, um, uh, you know, to the modern American action audience. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, th th that's something that is, is just about done. Like the, uh, the, you know, the colors are wrapping up right now on the, uh, on the final issue and, um, we're going to be looking for a home on that. Um, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the jump will, uh, will need a publishing home very soon. Um, and man, I have a laundry list of just kind of like, you know, badass, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of action movies, uh, uh, come to life in comics, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm happy to find homes with. Um, so yeah, um, you know, that's about it. You know, like you kind of playing some things close to the best because, sure. uh, you know, certain things you can talk about and can't talk about, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we're, 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 you know, we're here and we should get to it. Um, you have a Kickstarter, uh, kicking off on, on Monday and I'm excited to hear about it. And yeah. excited to hear about well, it. you know, um, you know, I, I have a project that I've been teasing for a very long time. Uh, if you read my newsletter, pep talks, uh, I, I have a project that's been called a uh, codename project saffron. And uh, on Monday, we're going to reveal what it is. Um, I'm really excited for this. This is my first stab at fantasy. Uh, but like any book that I do, uh, calling it just fantasy is not particularly accurate. It, uh, you know, I love doing mashups. I love kind of reinventing genres. And so I, I consider this book to be uh, very much a, a spiritual sequel to my first book, Spencer and Locke, which was uh, what if Calvin and Hobbes grew up in Sin City. Uh, we're doing that for fantasy, and uh, I'm very excited. I'm working with uh, artist Ruben Rojas, who is the most talented artist you don't know about yet. Um, uh, He's good. Uh, uh, Giant Days uh, colorist Whitney Kogar. That was an Eisner-winning book that she was on. Uh, uh, letterer DC Hopkins. And we've got uh, just a murderer's row of cover talent involved, uh, including uh, my pal uh, uh, Mon House from Spencer and Locke and going to the chapel. So yeah, uh, we're going to be launching that Monday morning, uh, first thing. Uh, so you can, you can subscribe to our pre-launch page. Uh, you can just go to bit.ly slash project saffron it's just one word all spelled out and uh yeah just keep your eyes peeled because monday morning we'll be unveiling the uh, the the true title and true concept of this book and uh when you see it you're gonna be like oh 
Pepos is at it again. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, this is, I think, one of the best things I've ever written. It's certainly one of the most beautiful books I've ever had the the good fortune to work on. And uh, yeah, and you know, if you if you love the Kickstarter, it all came right here from the brain pan. But if you hate it, I ask Rylan for all my help um, on on, my on, on on building the page. Uh, but yeah, no, you know, it's. Um, I think like what we were talking about earlier, I think Kickstarter, it, it is the way of the future. Um, you know, I think anybody who's not adopting it right now is kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're not leaving it all out on the field anymore. Uh, yeah. And so I, uh, I feel like, you know, being able to, to, to build that wider consensus, to invite more people to the table, to sort of have feed one audience to your previous work, um, Kickstarter lets you do all that. And it's not to say that working with traditional publishers is a bad thing. I mean, I am working with traditional publishers on, on, on books still. Um, so I, I love working with them. But I do think that combination of operating within the direct market, operating within Kickstarter, operating on digital and web comics and online, doing things outside of the direct market, these are that's going to be kind of the, the, the modern toolkit for creators moving forward. Uh, I think we're all, you know, it's like sharks. We got to keep moving forward or we're going to die. And um, so I think that's that I think Kickstarter, uh, you were really a big inspiration for that. So thank you. I mean, I I think uh, you and Charlie and Russell have all press ganged me for the last uh, better part of a year now to get me on board with this. And so I'm excited for people to get to see project Saffron and, and, and hopefully refer to it as, as, as the next, the jump. The next, the jump. Nice. The That's a jump. good way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess uh, if you uh, if you're if you missed the jump on mm-hmm. Kickstarter, uh, we still have our backer kit store open up. Uh, it is uh, the jump dot back the jump one word dot backer kit dot com. Uh, you can pick up your issues there, and and you know most anything that was uh, available during the Kickstarter campaign is uh, is available there, um, as well as uh, you know signed uh, uh, signed banjacks and aberrant issues and trades, uh, very rare comic uh, uh, comic con variants uh, um, that were you know that there are only twenty five of and stuff like that. Uh, uh, it's kind of a great place if you're uh, if you are a comic nerd, a Rylan Grant nerd, a uh, good place to visit right now. Um, Go ahead. So, Ryland, so for, for people who want to find more stuff about your work, uh, where, where's the best place for them to find you? Uh, I am on uh, all social media platforms at Ryland Grant. You can kind of see it on the screen right there. Uh, my name is spelled oddly. Uh, so yeah, uh, the Twitters, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, uh, you know, probably still have a MySpace that I, uh, I, I don't check too often, but hit me up there if you need to. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, again, backer, uh, the jump.backerkit.com. Great. And, uh, for anybody who wants to find my work, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Pepos D. It's just my last name and first initial. Uh, you can also follow, uh, project Saffron on Kickstarter right now. And, uh, hope to see you guys on launch on Monday. Rylan, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, you know, this I think was very insightful for me. I, I hope it was for our viewers as well. And uh, anything else you want to say in our last uh, two minutes before we sign off? Uh, uh, go back, Project Saffron. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm. It's going to be a race uh, 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 for who gets to be the first backer because I'm going to, I would be in there, you know, bidding away. What I will say is that uh, uh, the first 48 hours of a, a campaign are, are uber crucial. Um, uh, it basically sets the whole Kickstarter algorithm. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, how successful you are during those first 48 hours determines how much Kickstarter uh, promotes you internally and how many sort of at-large backers you end up with. So um, if you plan to back Project Saffron, and I certainly hope you do, uh, 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 like me, um, do so as quickly as possible. Awesome. I think... Uh... I think we might have frozen there. It happens. That's fine. You know, uh, we we ended on a bang. Um, so there, uh, there he is. He's lost back. Me again. He's back. Did we lose Pepos too? Uh, I just yeah. want to say thank you to you guys. Um, not only have you just been creating awesome content, creating just great reads that, 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 that everybody's talking about, but huge supporters of the mainframe Comic Con. These guys, you don't see all the stuff going on behind the scenes, all the phone calls, emails, and everything these guys are doing. And you will, however, see them scattered through the weekend 
hosting things, discussing things. So just huge thanks to you guys for supporting these yeah, uh, uh, great cause. You guys can, uh, for anybody who's interested, we will be on the uh, Hollywood and IP panel uh, starting at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and so, uh, and then on the Kickstarter panel uh, immediately after that. So uh, stay tuned because we'll have a lot more to talk about later today. Yeah, and I am, uh, let me see, I am hosting the, uh, I'm trying to get my info here. I am hosting the Immortal Studios panel uh, tomorrow at, uh, it's 10 a.m. Pacific, which I think, which makes 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and then um, at 4 p.m. Pacific tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, uh, David Avalone of, uh, of um, Drawing Blood fame and I are hosting the uh, first episode of our, uh, our podcast called The Writer's Block uh, with uh, David F. Walker um, and Erica Schultz. Uh, and, uh, and David Pepos is going to be on our, I believe, second episode, which I haven't talked to him about yet. That is a uh, Kickstarter. I'm game. I'm game. Uh, uh, which will, um, uh, uh, these, this uh, podcast will premiere first on um, the uh, Comic Core uh, YouTube channel. So uh, becoming part of the family. Very excited about it. Awesome. Yeah, I hear great things about that. Everybody's talking on the Comic Core side. Like, this show is going to be awesome. So thank you guys for contributing so much. Excellent. Uh, Take it easy, guys. We'll see you guys later on. For the rest of you that are hanging with Mainframe Comic Con, we got a lot of content coming. In fact, in 30 minutes here on Hall D, you're going to be able to enjoy the man, the myth, the legend, Kevin Eastman. We're going to have an hour block of turtle talk, people. We're going to have Kevin Eastman in an interview with C. Wood and Alec Whitewell Comics. And then we're following that with a modern turtles discussion. We're going to have Sophie Campbell, the writer artist who has worked on the IDW run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So we're going to have an hour run starting at 3 o'clock Eastern to 4 o'clock. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be hanging around. There's four other panel rooms that you could go to. How do you find them? You've got to go over to mainframecomiccon.com. They list everything, and you can click on a panel and go straight to that YouTube to see what's going on. There are things happening constantly through the weekend. Uh, make sure you also, if you can, make a little donation to the Hero Initiative. This is a charity that supports comic book creators, writers, and artists when they need financial, uh, when they have financial issues, health issues, and they are basically funding this entire free event for all of you. So they're making this content possible, this charity. And of course, that's a big reason why all these writers, artists, creators are here for all of us to enjoy. So please go over if you have the time and you've got 28 minutes until we've got our man, Kevin Eastman in here. So take a second if you can check out that site. And I hope to see you all back here shortly for Kevin Eastman and Turtle Talk.
guys. What's up? Man, thank you so much, Alec, for having me on Hall D here. We're getting ready to have a heck of a guest once again. We're having a, it's almost like it's a sequel from the yeah. original mainframe Comic Con where it's the, being the out again. But we get to bring on with us once again returning to mainframe Comic Con, Kevin Eastman. So I said let's just go ahead and uh he's ready to go. And there, there he is. Come on, Kevin. So my first it's great question to see is, you again. I just got to ask, how are you doing, Kevin? Are you staying healthy through all of this insanity in the world right now? I am. Yes. Thanks for asking. And uh, uh, yeah, we're we're hunkered down pretty well, and we've been really blessed. Um, uh, we've got plenty of work. Um, our family is safe and healthy, and uh, our son is as well. Yeah. So we're great. Nice. I hope it's the same for you guys. You guys doing all right as well? So far, so good. Uh, well, <laughs> how about you, Alec? Right, I'm in Florida, so I'm I'm doing my best. Yes. Well, I know you're a hot spot. We're, well, I'm in California, so I'm in San Diego area. So it's like we, we yeah. have to be, you know, we all have to be careful anyway, but it's just sort of one of those like, oh, just doesn't, you know, doesn't take much to, to, to take, the, take the extra step to be uh, a little yeah. more protective of all of our loved ones. So. Definitely. Absolutely. And I just want to remind Nothing. everybody that we're here in part uh, to help support the Hero Initiative. Uh, so definitely Absolutely. visit heroinitiative.org. Uh, to see how you can help them out. And as well, any Super Chats from this weekend's event will go directly to the Hero Initiative. Uh, so if you guys got questions in the chat, just feel free to throw them out there. I'll get to them as best I can. Uh, but the first question I actually wanted to ask, uh, before we even start talking Team and T, because when you get Kevin East, when you're going to mention Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, of course, I want to <laughs> talk about Drawing Blood. I didn't get a chance to ask about Drawing Blood last time, so... What were some of the inspirations that went in, into creating this with David Avalon? Because this is a pretty fun and interesting story. Thank you. No, thanks for asking about it. It, it really was a, um, it's one of those projects that evolved naturally, which I think is is the greatest creative space to be in. And what I mean by that is uh, there's a lot of um, semi-autobiographical things in there. Um, for example, I started writing this, uh, like a sketchbook diary, probably 10, 10, 10 years plus ago. And it was about interesting experiences I had, whether it be in the world of comic books, publishing, uh, experiences in Hollywood, just really truth is, can be stranger than fiction sometimes. And so there's this really bizarre um, stuff that I was experiencing and it was so funny. Um, I found it humorous. And then at the same time, you know, a lot of times going to comic conventions and things like that, I'd see, um, I'd, I'd get to hang out after hours with, you know, different, uh, um, other people, you know, Alan Moore and Frank Miller and other people, and, and they would sort of all these stories of things that they were experiencing. It was just like, so I would write all these things down. And out of that, I, I kind of thought if I created a character that was like uh, existed within the world of comic books, the comic book world we all know and we live in, I exist in this space where this character that David Avaloni and I created called um, Shane Bookman, and we did kind of a spinal tap sort of take on it, but we could go farther and deeper and push it you know so we could add a little berry and a little uh let's call saul and spinal tap and really sort of create this character that we could put to uh put through the paces and, and have a good time and tell a, a great story set within our, a comic universe so it's um we call it the um, completely fictional true story of Kane Bookman and his creation of the radically rearranged Ronan Ragdolls with his brother Paul uh and that was an ode to uh Eastman and Laird's Turtles, you know, a decade or so earlier, and he had a huge amount of success, um, went down the other side of the mountain, and now he's sort of digging his way back. So it's, there's, you know, there's gunfights, there's, um, you know, call girls, there's gangsters, there's, you know, everything you can imagine, and uh, David and I are having an absolute blast doing it. And, and how much of that is autobiographical? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like... Um, I laugh because uh, in the first six pages of issue one, uh, Shane Bookman and his best friend, Nigel Boswell, nicknamed Beasley, which is um, directly inspired by my you know, dear friend, Simon Bisley, um, get into a gunfight. And I have yet to be in a gunfight. You never know. I've not been in a gunfight. So there are chunks of it, um, some foundation that is autobiographical. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's pulled from a lot of other stuff, David's experiences and, and, and mine. 
Um, and but other, a lot of it's um, to uh, other people we know. And I want to mention too, most of all, is uh, uh, we're very, very lucky that artist uh, Ben Bishop is the one that's bringing these fantastic scripts, uh, these ideas of mine, these fantastic scripts of David's. Um, Ben's, Ben's bringing it all to life. Um, and the regular comic book, there's flashbacks and there's hallucination scenes also that we use uh, the fantastic Troy Little. Who's you know he's done everything from you know Rick and Morty meets uh, um, uh, oh god uh, he does he's done Rick and Morty comics he's done uh, Angora Napkin he did the radically rearranged from Ragdoll's comic um, so it's a really great little family of creative people bringing this bringing this project that, to life that, that would have been a, a tremendous story if you if you brought up that oh yeah, by the way that time I dueled Simon Bisley. <laughs> it, it is. It's, it's so much of that. There's like in funny. There's a there's a scene in the um, in issue four because um, we're currently working on issues five through eight. The, it was our second Kickstarter we did last year. We're we're nearing the end of this next round. It's going to be twelve issues total um, that'll complete mm -hmm. the first arc. Um, but there's a great scene in issue four where um, Shane Bookman is going into uh, this convention at New York City Comic Con to help validate um, the fact that Morgan Harbor, which is no relation to Michael Bay, uh, Morgan Harbor, Michael Bay. Um, <laughs> Morgan Harbor decided to make their creation, and he's doing this radically dark live action reimagining of the characters, and he's making them aliens instead of mutants, and all the fans are in an uproar. Um, and so uh, and Shane is going there, and there's a moment where Shane meets Dave, Dave Shane meets me as Kevin Eastman at that, and that little exchange before he goes in and and uh, sets everything right and makes sure that the characters remain um, mutants, not aliens. So there's, there's a lot of pieces <laughs> like that, that um, fans that know any, you know, that know the turtle history will sort of go, oh, I remember, I know where that little, was. Little, little Easter eggs for the fans. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a great series. And I think that, uh, um, you know, when people start sinking their teeth into it, I think they really get a kick out of it. So thanks for bringing it up. So, oh, yeah. no problem. I was actually gonna ask, um, where can people find Drawing Blood the easiest? I know you mentioned Kickstarter. Obviously, the copies I have, I found at a local shop. Is there a, a, a definitive way people should try to find Drawing Blood? Well, if you go, you can find um, back issues, the individual issues that we have still in stock at KevinEastmanStudios.com. You know, pretty much anything you want to know about anything I'm doing or what's going on from the various different projects I'm working on. You can go there, you can order all kinds of, you know, back issues and things like that, like drawing blood and, and some of the individual issues. But we had actually um, scheduled to ship the volume one um, collection that included issues one through four, as well as the radically rearranged one and Ragdolls all in one trade with a big behind the scenes thing. It was supposed to ship in April. Um, so that went the wayside. So um, in our conversations with Diamond, they said resolicit for it. So we're going to, Resolicit for it later this fall for the collection, but you can find most of the stuff we still have in stock at, at Eastman Studios. Awesome! That, that's and I very just uh, linked link that in the chat for you. Thanks. Yeah, so definitely visit Kevin Eastman Studios. There's a lot of other awesome things you can find there, of course. But I want to transition now into the current run turtles because this current run has been so amazing. And once again, congratulations for hitting that 100 issue mark. I think we talked a little bit about that last time. Uh, but I was just kind of curious as to what the long-term plan is now because there's been so many new seeds planted in like the last six or seven issues. Like how far out are you guys planning on the new run? <laughs> oh, it's uh, um, my cat's trying to break out of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're stuck in here now. Um, the, the, uh, um, well, after, um, you know, um, the incredible Tom Walsh, guided us through 100 issues and we wrapped that up in um, uh, December of last year. Then the incredibly awesome, equally awesome uh, uh, Sophie uh, Campbell took over for the first seven issues. And now there's a, <clears throat> a few related. So it was sort of like in the, um, the seeds that have been planted, not only in the first, like you said, seven issues that Sophie's written and oversaw and then um, um, uh, we come uh, put out an annual, uh, a 220 right. annual came out. So sort of collected some of, what's been going on while this particular series is focused on what's going on in mutant town which is where you know these mutants that have been sort of all corralled and sort of put into the section of new york um <clears throat> but we work generally about four or five issues out um and a lot of times there's a there's a bigger plan that will cover say 12 issues plus but then it sort of hunkers down into uh 
at least a couple issues ahead. Like, you know, I'm working on the cover of issue nine right now. Uh, it's actually due on Monday. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but um, yeah, but it's been interesting. It was sort of once the pep publishing schedule and now that so many shops can reopen and we can start getting back into a regular flow, we've, we've been doing a little catch up and doing a little um, uh, forward thinking. So we want we want to catch everybody up and, and uh, keep them interested. There's some fun stuff coming up. Awesome. And I just want to say a special thank you to Just Arika and his comics, our friend Rod over there. Uh, he says, I'll speak for my good friend. Thanks for everything, Eastman. Yeah, I think his friend is tied up at work. He said he can't be here for the live stream. I'm sure he'll watch it on the rewind. But just big thanks once again for Just Arika and for the $10 super chat. That'll be going right to the Hero Initiative. Uh, and speaking of long term planning, another question I want to ask was about a specific character. And this character had such a big impact on the City at War storyline. That's Old Hob. So yeah. when I was reading the original first trade of Turtles, I didn't know if Old Hob was going to be like this, just like almost filler type character, or if he was going to have this like nice long run and grow as a, such a big character like he did. So my question is like, did you guys have this plan to keep Old Hob for those 100 issues and to have him? You know, eventually have this pivotal moment where he's kind of almost responsible for the creation of Mutant Town. Yep, absolutely. No, that's you know that's what's been so absolutely incredibly wonderful. The entire experience, starting with you know when um, I was asked to join in with the team back in issue you know August. Uh, I think the first issue came in August 2011, but I come had come in earlier by invitation by IDW and and get to start working with the, the incredible Tom Waltz and then Bobby Kernow, a series editor who's been through the whole things. And, and back then we were hoping for like fingers and toes crossed that would make it for a year. If we could do 12 issues, it would be like, yes. Um, but the fans really um, came out and supported this project. And we got through that first year, you know, with art by the awesomely talented uh, Dan Duncan. Um, but the characters that sort of were created like old Hob and some of the ones that we sort of set up in that first year, we didn't have a specific plan for the next year because we weren't sure if we'd have sure. <laughs> another year. Um, but as it started by we, by the time we were getting well through year two, we could really see um, sales are holding steady. The support was really great. So we were able to look farther down the road. Um, and it was one of those Hail Marys that we were thinking like, all right, if we can make the issue 50, that would be incredible. Um, so, <laughs> the, the best part of the entire creative process, not only with um, the writing and the, the long-term vision of where we'd like to see it go and the artists we get to work with, uh, has just been always um, story first. And it's been one of those things where the things that you sort of set up and the things that evolve as you're working through each issue and through each arc, new ideas come out of that. And you sort of hold on to those darlings and sort of look where you can put them in place all these that make sense, you know, like, hey, let's kill off a carrot or bump up sales, or let's do this to, you know, create some, you know, new interest in the series. You're either going to like it the way we're doing it, and thankfully everybody has, or, uh, you know, we, we don't want to, uh, we just want to keep true to the, to the, the story. Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely definitely shows there's a reason why, you know, it's it's lasted this long, and there's, you know, you, you know a lot of people say it's some of the best Turtles books ever, so... Um, it, I mean, it shows that you're you're putting the care and the thought into it for sure. Well, that's all you know. I get to, you know, put all that blame on Tom Wallace once again. <laughs> He's really um, it's like uh, you know, if there was three men and a baby, it'd be like you know, me and Peter and Tom kind of thing. He's the official stepfather of the turtles, and he has such love and passion and care for the characters. Um, that uh, um, no, it's just been one of those. Um, it's it's been a blessing, and we've had so much fun. And I call it kind of. I feel like it's, I equate it to, you know, Walt Simonson's run on Thor, because um, everybody loves what, you know, Stan and Jack did originally, but a lot of people feel like Walt Simonson's run on Thor was sort of the definitive Thor, um, because it captured so many things and it threaded together so many wonderful things about that universe and the character. Um, I feel that Tom's, um, Tom's 100 issues really is a definitive thing. It's not you know, setting aside the original black and white series, but this is a really definitive uh, yeah. that sets up so everything to it. So. You need so, to um, a series of it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Alec. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, touch base on the last Ronin a little bit. Yes. Um, so first of all, I, I I'm not a big speculator, but I I it does I do find myself curious about it. 
So there's a lot of talk about the variant for issue 104. Is that the first appearance of Last Ronin on the cover? No, on, on issue 104. Um, yeah, oh. there's a there's a variant that came out that people are all excited about because it shows a turtle with a bunch of different weapons, and people think it's the Last Ronin. Oh, well, you know, I have to look at that because I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Um, but, I didn't yeah. think so either, but <laughs> it's it's going wild on eBay right now. Oh, really? <laughs> I have to yeah. look at that now. If I have some, I'll yeah. um, put some on me. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, but because <laughs> we really, um, the ideas that evolved, as, as you know, you read through some of the press, um, you know, yeah. originally and then even recently, it was, um, you know, it's based on a, um, a, a 20 page treatment that Peter and I wrote back in uh, 1987. It was set 30 years in the future, so 2017. So the, it's funny that it's by the time Tom and I really sort of started focusing on it as we would like to go after issue 100 as a separate uh, as a separate uh, series. Um, you know, it was already you know 31 years <laughs> since yeah, right. the original idea, and a year passed when we originally said it. Um, so we took uh, quite seriously and quite sincerely. Um, uh, a lot of the original ideas and concepts and threads and, and things that were sort of set up in that original treatment. And then we adapted it and sort of, you know, pushed it 15 to 20 years in the future from now. Um, but um, we, we we updated a lot of things and added a lot of things, but we really wanted to stay true to so many of the ideas that were originally brought back then because it was really a very interesting look when you think of, in 1987, Peter and I were just working, uh, just finishing and, and, and uh, printing uh, issue 11, which wrapped up, you know, um, the first, I guess I call it the first 15 issues, which is, you know, issues one through 11 plus the one, uh, one issue. Um, right. The, 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 the Raphael issue. Yeah. So we were sort of in that space. And I think we were, where are we going after issue 11? And then we went like, well, what if we looked way down the road and what they did <laughs> in 30 years? And we sort of then use that as a, something we can look at and, and head in that direction. And so the evolution of this idea came around in the same way that we were looking at after issue 100 going, well, where are we going to go after this? There was a lot of ideas, but I, I showed this idea to Tom and that's when it really got exciting. We really, um, uh, you know, we were completely mind melded on it and uh, mine, it's just, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm literally, I'm like, I have a uh, last round of pages stacked up over there <laughs> that I'm working on now and I've got a, I'm doing a Conan story for Marvel, which I'm doing over there. And I've got a few other covers. So that, that was actually going to be my first real question about The Last Ronin, which was, um, what, why exactly do you think that it took so long to actually make this come to fruition? Was it just circumstance? It just wasn't the right time or it needed the right creative team? Because, you know, like you said, you've had this idea for a couple of years. <laughs> Well, it was, it's, you know, it's a really good question because it was something that, um, you know, in this folder where I kept a, a lot of ideas that Peter and I had, um, uh, I think there's still, you know, another um, dozen or so of things that, you know, just whether it be, you know, a couple of post-it notes of what about this, what about this to say a two or three page treatment. It was sort of, everything was set and beholden to that original Mirage universe, which really for all, uh, you know, purposes really really didn't exist. It was a universe within itself. I mean, you look at the different turtle universes that have evolved when you look at, I don't know, the Archie series or the original animated series or the 2012, you know, Nickelodeon series to some of the movies, everyone sort of had their different place and space in this turtle universe that was sort of built around this, you know, the, the home world, I guess, of what Peter and I originally did. And it just felt like um, it didn't fit into any of those universes. And so when, Tom and I got to the end of um, the, the original ongoing run issue 100. We looked at it and said, well, what if we took this idea? And that was, well, the spark was, what if we took this idea and set it up in a universe where it's not the IDW universe, it's not any other universe you've, we've seen. It does lean heavily uh, towards the Mirage universe, but I guess our approach and the excitement um, and what we pitched to Nickelodeon and IDW was, like when Dark Knight first came out, it was a universe within itself. It played off elements and characters that you knew and well within the Batman universe, but it was sort of set off to the left or off to the right, however you want to look at it. And um, we wanted it to be um, more intense, a lot more action, um, you know, mm. 
that's you know 40 pages per issue for five issues i've asked for you know 20 page fight scene set pieces in each issue that i'm designing um just i wanted to go all out and take it to a place where it plays on so many of the elements both time it plays on so many original elements but it does it's i'm trying not to give too much away there is closure there is there's you know this this aspect of this family and the vengeance that basically you know you look at the first issue of the turtles and they were raised and trained to kill you know a rokusaki that was the original concept in issue one um you know here we are 36 years later in the overall series and so we really wanted to put some closure on a different elements but it is a universe within in itself so there's uh, the timing just um made sense and it finally made yeah. sense in a way that we could do something cool and positive and, and stop, you know, um, tell a really good story that was the most important thing to us yeah I, um, I'm, I'm excited for it it's going to be a premium format right it's going to be a larger yeah. format yeah we felt um you know we wanted to um and that was a discussion we had early on and i think they're still um, they're still working on the size thing but my my hope and dream was a uh, promenade uh, was to do it um uh, the same size as like the original turtle uh, comic books. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's sort of larger and, and uh, you know, yeah, we've got some, we want a lot of meat on the bones, so to speak. <laughs> so if you, when you sink your teeth, because, you know, Peter and I did, I think uh, uh, most of our issues were between 35 and 40 pages long, uh, you know, except yeah. for some, you know, the single little character one shot. But, uh, so we wanted this to be in that, in that same neighborhood. So my next question I wanted to ask, and by the way, we do have Sophie Campbell joining us here in about 10 minutes or so. And I wanted to mention that because there has been an awesome influx of female characters and influence in the TMNT, especially recently. So I was going to ask, uh, and my friend Katrin Figures from the Comic Court channel wanted me to kind of allude to all these awesome characters as well. Uh, rather it be Alopex, Jenica, even Venus from the Next Mutation. What's it been like working with these female characters around the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as we know them? Well, you know that's a, it's a great question because it is one of those things that um, you know Peter and I back in the earliest days we we're huge fans of um, strong female characters. I mean, whether it be our love and appreciation to you know Sarah Connor or Lieutenant Ripley or you know you know so many others. The list is is long. So we wanted them. Um, to always have that kind of presence in the turtle universe. And when, um, you know, I worked on the original um, Venus de Milo series, which, you know, a lot of fans didn't like, and I understand why, of course, it was sort of forced and put into a, a context that didn't really make sense of how we launched it. Um, but, you know, from the original Archie series, um, Dean Clorain and others, we did Ninjara, and there was, you know, a lot of great, awesome, you know, Sally, there's a lot of great female characters. And so Tom and I, um, once we get the issue 50, we were sort of looking at um, how to bring in another uh, more strong female characters. And that's where um, Tom came up with the idea for this character, Jenica, which um, was uh, was part of issue 51. We were sort of wanted to see, because we liked the idea, and we, as we put her into the series, wanted to see um, how she worked into it story-wise and, and, and as well as the fan reaction. Um, when she became popular and um, and we really made a, a bigger part of the whole family uh, along with the other uh, characters. We, we, <laughs> Tom really wanted to bring a female turtle in, but it was, uh, as I could agree, I had already tried it and, and didn't work as well as I'd hoped. Um, but as the plan sort of came together, um, I think it was around issue 60, 65, that he was, it, we were just sort of like, we see a way that we can turn Transition Jenica into uh, uh, the fifth turtle, the fifth female, uh, fifth turtle and make it a female. And, and the idea loosely was around, you know, how like she helped became she helped the transfusion and all that stuff. And he even reached out to so Tom reached out to Sophie initially and said, "Hey, I've got this idea, and I think we can figure out a way to fit it in." And Sophie did those original sketches, um, which we did. We, there was no deviation from what she originally sketched to what we then ended up using in issue ninety-five when we introduced her. Um, so it was one of those things that we it was a hail mary only in the sense that we loved it. It made sense story wise. We hoped that when it came out, the fans would really support it. And man, the response was just fantastic and over the top. So we, we're thrilled to, to, to have um, that kind of strong character, female character within the Turtles family initially. And then what's great about um, 
what Sophie's been doing so beautifully with um, uh, Mutant Town. She's just brought up, brought in a whole wider, much wider range of mutant characters, which was the cool part of uh, we when we had an old hob set off the mutagen bomb and and what happened in the mutagen what happened to this whole new uh, army of mutants he was trying to make it raise an army and sophie really took that idea to the next level she said well i'm going to make this um you know all those characters are still based on human you know characters and emotions and experiences and and stuff so they had this life before but now they're living and, and trying to figure out how their life is going to evolve as, as mutants and so and she plays that character stuff um sophie does she plays that character stuff so well and so beautifully so uh, um yeah she she deserves all the credit for really bringing that uh, that whole community to life in, in every sense of the word yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Lord Smaff and the uh, Chess talking about how much he likes Jenica and the Mutant Town and how that's such a cool concept. And I agree. I think the Mutant Town stuff has really brought in a breath of fresh air into the title. And, you know, I was actually going to ask, like, what was it like getting a chance to create Mutant Town? And how many, like, creative freedoms that opened up to have all these new mutants all of a sudden? Well, that was, a, that was so much fun. That was the kind of the, the idea where, you know, when we had in – in the past and they were in the original up to 100 run when new characters mute characters brought in it was sort of um you know baxter uh, stockman had some involvement in it on one level you had uh, bishop agent bishop sort of with slash and what he was doing and then so it was never um it was always sort of mean, i don't say mean-spirited but it was i mean you know, slash was kind of a weapon used for this and it was that so we really couldn't find a way to create a wider mutant um, family, you know, I would say outside of the mutanimals, which was sort of, we wanted to keep that contained to a certain group of people um, and that. So when we saw this opportunity again, we had the mutagen bomb go off and we had all these characters created and originally, <laughs> originally, you know, we actually were like going to have the whole island of New York, uh, Manhattan, be, you know, turned into mutants and it was like, no, 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 that's, that's crazy. So we scaled it back to a smaller crowd where we could contain it. But then once that um, that family and the, 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 um, the amount of mutants that were created um, was established. That was really sort of where we handed it off to, to Sophie. So she's really brought that, that world to life uh, again. So, so beautiful. So. Absolutely. Um, I've got a, a couple of, <laughs> what's that? I said more characters we can play with down the road. Oh yeah, Sophie. definitely. Always, always fun to have more toys. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, Quick question, just a curiosity question, and then a real question. Uh, my quick question is, out of curiosity, how many copies of issue one do you still have? <laughs> uh, four. Yeah? Seriously. <laughs> Actually, two that my, we had two that we had kept. Um, and then um, my dad recently, he was, uh, uh, he, he's, he collects a lot of like old um, hot rod magazines and, and car magazines and just, they're, you know, Every one of them's labeled and stored, and, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, bags and, and boarded, and he, he loves that stuff. But he had saved um, two copies uh, that uh, um, were signed by Peter and I at the very first Portsmouth Comic Con. Um, oh wow! You know, <laughs> and so he, but he, had, you know, bagged them and sort of put them away, and um, and so last year uh, as a gift, he 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 said, "Well, I want you to have one back, but I want to." give one to, to, to Shane, uh, our son, Shane, he's mm. just, just 14. Now. Um, but yeah, when we did those, um, it was, you know, we couldn't imagine it being worth anything more than, than what you were asking for. It. Yeah. And what we were asking for it. It was, and so a lot of it was like, you know, I would give them to f friends and relatives and, you know, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I can't yeah. afford anything else. Here's a copy of my comic book. <laughs> Um, so a lot of them were, were, were definitely passed on to friends and family. Yeah. So, so the, the two that you kept, those, that you still have those, and those were from when you first put it out? Yep, yep, those are when I first so put you, it out. You, you never like went back and said, oh, shoot, I should have kept one and went and bought one? <laughs> no, <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those, um, no, just I, I had the two, and, and again, we never, you know, and I've seen, you know, when we've all seen, you know, and, and as comics, um, you know, uh, as uh, collectible comics and original art and things like that, um, 
have gone up. I was just looking, you know, scanning the re most recent heritage auction site just for some of the stuff, and we're seeing, you know, 35, 40, 50,000 on, you know, yeah, crazy. Seven, five Captain Americas and things like that. Some of these comics and mm -hmm. in, in original art has gone through the roof. I think the first couple of pages of original art Pete and I sold on the Turtles was like, you know, I think we, it was $25 or $30 a page. And we, I think we both were like, you know what? We put a lot of work into these pages. Let's just save them. So I, you know, I, he saved a lot more than I have, but uh, definitely started just holding on to uh, the original art, especially. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> um, so my, my real question is a little more in depth. Uh, if we have the time, we're running right up at 3.30, so maybe we don't. Okay. Um, but I was just wondering really quickly what you feel like uh, kind of the future is for independent self-published comics. Um, it's a it's a good question, and it's uh, there's a you know there's a long answer, but I think the the short answer version is for sure that as long as people have the uh, the incentive, the drive, the will, and they want to put out original ideas, I've seen such diversification not only in uh, publishing of things um, that are happening on independent comic books, but even when say Diamond or some of the other big distributors shut the door on supporting or getting out to the market independent comic books just it's a it's a it's a difficult thing to wrangle and manage yeah. um you know internet print on demand um you know facebook socialization clubs i mean everything that people can get clubs and get their ideas and get this this vision of what they want to say creatively through the combination of words and pictures comic books graphic novels um i think it's 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 going to stay strong and i think once we get past um some of the issues we're all overcoming right now um, cause we miss being out there on the road. We miss seeing the fans as much as, um, yeah, so do we, they miss, you know, we all miss that. Why, why we're trying to do this. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I, we, I do every one of these that I'm invited to, cause I think it's so important cause it's, uh, uh but I think that, um, you know, we're, we wait for that normalcy where we can get out there and support cause I would, you know, we, we want it to be, um, a, a great creative environment that would continue growing and, and coming up with some really great ideas. So. Yeah. I'm, I'm super positive and super hopeful about the comics as a, as a entertainment medium overall. Love to hear that. Um, well, so we are, we are running up at three 30, uh, which is going to be, uh, we're going to be bringing on Sophie Campbell here. Um, obviously we understand if you have to leave, but if you want to hang out, you're all going to do that too. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I'd love to hang out, but I also feel like, um, I have so much respect for Sophie. She's got a lot to say, and she's really got oh, some absolutely. stuff going on. So I want to. I don't want. I want to crowd her space. So, uh, Fair enough. Do some. You know, I. Uh, I just. I love her. I think she's. She's a great talent. I'm so glad that we have her as part of the Turtle family. Um, absolutely. So, uh, um, tell her. You know, all the best, Sophie. Hope to see you live and in person one day soon. And, uh, same with well, you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to see you at a con again. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin Eastman, for taking the time. And uh, thank you for doing my job and introducing Sophie much better than I would have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do just fine. So, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure as always. I hope to get to see you again. So maybe, yeah, once uh, we finally uh, get the last Ronin out on the sands, we can uh, we can revisit and uh, chat a bit more. Absolutely. I'd love That'd that. That would be awesome. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kevin. Cowabunga, right. man. Alabanga. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Well, that was awesome. Uh, so now we're going to bring on our next guest, who Kevin just uh, sang the praises of, rightfully so. We got Sophie Campbell coming on. Welcome, Sophie. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, so your, mic, your mic, is, mic is muted. Yeah, sorry, there we go. There we go. Hello. Hey, thanks welcome, for welcome. Me. Absolutely, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, so I'm going to start by asking the kind of the same thing that uh, we're asking all our guests: is how are you holding up during these crazy times? Um, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I kind of like it because I don't have to do anything. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's nice. I mean, yeah. like obviously, you know, people are dying and businesses are failing and stuff. Right. But, at least I get to stay at home in my pajamas all day. Right. In, in, a, in a vacuum, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so I definitely want to start by saying as well, the uh, I'm, I'm glad you're doing all right, that for sure. Uh, but this run of TMNT, I was telling Kevin, has been a just a huge breath of fresh air into the franchise, in my opinion. I really enjoyed the, the road to 100 and all that, but what you've done with post-100 has been amazing. Uh, just getting a chance to, like, you actually broke up the family for a little bit. Um, and that was because of the death of Splinter. So I was just kind of curious what it was like getting a chance to create uh, almost the funeral for this iconic character, Splinter, and how emotional that must have been for you. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, I feel like, I feel like Tom and everyone else, you know, like they got to, they did the part where he actually dies. So like, um, I felt like in some ways the heavy lifting was already done a little bit. Um, and, but I mean, yeah, it's sad, but I don't know. I felt like I had like a definite idea of where the character should go and how they should deal uh, with it and what should happen after he was dead. So, um, I don't know if I felt super emotional about it. I mean, like maybe that's because I was like too in it, you know, sure. doing it. I don't know. Um, I mean, I hope it, you know, resonated the way I picked up the pieces and stuff um, and trying to figure out a way for his like legacy to live on and all that stuff. Oh, I think you absolutely did. Especially like when you see that scene where of all turtles, you see Michelangelo just breaking down, who's usually just the fun loving party dude. And you see him go from fun loving party dude to just bawling his eyes out and his other brothers are huddled around him when they're all hugging and stuff. So I definitely think you nailed the emotional impact of that scene. But it's funny you mentioned the Splinter Clan because I want to talk a little bit about that next. Um, what was it like getting a chance to put Characters like Jenica and Alpex are basically in in the inner circle now. So uh, what was it like adding those characters? And are we going to see any other characters potentially soon in the Splinter Clan? Um, that was, yeah, that was really cool. I was really glad that they let me do that. Like, um, you know, the Hamato Clan, you know, they're great and everything. But I felt like, uh, yeah, Lord Smaps does. I'm very good at drawing sad turtles. That's definitely my uh, forte. His turtles. <laughs> um, yeah, with the Splinter Clan, I I just felt like, you know, they were they were making this dojo, and they had you know they had lost somebody from their clan, and it just it just made like total sense especially like you know for alapex like she's been there since like day one almost absolutely yeah like god like, you know throw her a bone or something put her in the clan um yeah so that was really cool i'm glad they let me do that and um i don't have any like uh there's kind of gonna be new additions to the actual clan but um not not in the way that you might think um so there's gonna there's not gonna be any like main like new members who are gonna show up and you know like get their own mask or whatever you know besides alifex um but you know and they're they're like you know they're the kind of six like ninja masters and i think you know it's gonna take a bit for another like actual ninja master to show up and you know, be taken in as like a new sensei. Alec? Um, I have kind of like a more general broad question for you and which uh, always kind of curiosity for me for a lot of creators is what was kind of the moment you realized you wanted to work in comics? Um, Probably pretty early. I was really into, um, when I was a kid, I was really into Calvin and Hobbes and the old Mirage Turtle books. And, oh yeah. Like that's what that's what really got me into it was like um I had I had like the four like colorized, I think first publishing was the company. And there were like these four collected books that were colorized from the original black and yep. white stuff. I yeah, had I, had, I had a couple of those. Yeah, I remember yeah. those. <laughs> yeah, so so I had those and that was like that was pretty much it. Um and I guess the rest is history after that. 
I was pretty, yeah, um, I, think I, I think I was like nine or 10 when I had that. Were you, were you one of those kids just constantly doodling in your notebooks at school? Oh, yeah. Or, <laughs> you're just like, I, I just want to draw turtles. I don't want to pay attention to math. Uh, yeah, drawing turtles, drawing other, you know, cartoons and creatures and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it was pretty early on. Yeah, I know my art teacher got mad at me for drawing turtles nonstop. He'd ask me to draw something else, and I ended up being Leonardo with a sword or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah, that's actually going to be my next question is, like, what type of background do you have uh, with the Ninja Turtles? Obviously, you, sa you said you collected the Mirage stuff. Was there anything else, like the movies or uh, action figures you had a chance to enjoy as a kid? Yeah, I was really into the toys. That was, like, the first thing that got me into the Turtles, like – I was never like really into TV that much when I was a kid. Um, I would watch like, you know, a couple episodes of the Turtles cartoon here and there, but it was the toys and the old Palladium RPG, uh, uh, TMNT and other strangeness. That's what like really got me into it. And mm -hmm. I kind of like shunned all the cartoon stuff after that. Like, you know, I was like a purist when I was like 10 years old. Um, I, I painted, I painted the masks on all my toys red, <laughs> Nice. but, uh, yeah, like I remember seeing, I remember seeing the first movie in theaters when I was a kid, but by the time the second one rolled around, like I was already in that like purist mode, you know, where I was just like, ah, it's just silly, you know, it's silly when they have the colored masks, forget it. And I kind of like, um, I kind of snubbed Secret of uh, Secret of the Ooze until many years later when when I wasn't such a hard ass. <laughs> yeah. I feel but, like yeah. I went through that same phase too with Secret <laughs> of the Ooze, where it's just like you kind of grow up and then you watch it again, like when you're on college age, just like yeah, this really is like a kids movie. But then you get like even a little bit older, and you're just like, you know what, this is a fun movie. I, I yeah, <laughs> it's, I it's, like it's, def it's definitely cyclical. <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot of good stuff in it. It's got. Absolutely when you like if you watch it with the idea that dr perry is an alien the whole movie suddenly makes sense <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love toka and razar it's got a lot of good stuff in there just when Schroeder you turtles and babies makes it for me what's that? Turtles in time though um i that was another one i snubbed as a kid but yeah re-watching it it's it's not that bad it's not as bad as people <laughs> think it is um, it's it's funny because when I was a kid, like I certainly had a great uh, affection for the the original, real, real turtles, for lack of a better term, uh, over the cartoon turtles. But you know, I loved the cartoon turtles too because I grew up with them, and I saw the first two movies in the theater and, and enjoyed them. Certainly the first one a lot, and then the third one came out. I definitely remember seeing it and being like. Well, this kind of sucks. <laughs> like, it was that, the first time where I'm like, I feel like they're kind of taking this a little too far. I mean, it's fun for what it is, but it's, the first yeah. movie I think is really. Yeah, the first really, one's definitely the best. It's great. Yeah, and I was actually going to ask about Lita, one of the newer characters in the TMNT run. And when we get kind of the twist with her character, She's holding a staff that kind of looks like something from that Turtles movie, actually. Yeah. Is that, like, it a lot of influence from that, or is that just me seeing what I want to see? That's <laughs> Well, that's uh, Renette's Time Scepter from... Oh, that's right. Yeah. It doesn't... I tried to make it look more like uh, the Scepter in the Mirage books, and except, like, in the, in the old comics, it had this, like clawed hand or whatever on top of like the hourglass and i was just like i don't feel like drawing that hand over and over so i just, just removed the hand and made a kind of a combination of like the scepter she was using in um turtles in time and bebop and rocksteady destroy everything um but yeah that's that's renette's time scepter gotcha um, okay yeah well, you know, I feel like the one in Turtles 3 is kind of influenced by Renette's Time Scepter. So I guess it's sort of the movie Scepter in a way. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked Kevin previously about this awesome female influence on TMNT recently. Um, 
what has it been like getting a chance to insert all of these new female characters? I know we didn't get a chance to talk about it too much previously, but Sally is another one that I think is uh, has potential to be a very awesome character. And, yeah. of course, Jenica, too. So are there some of your favorites that you've had a chance to not only work with, but get a chance to create for the first time? Yeah. Um, I mean, going back to uh, the Northampton arc, Koya is still my favorite. Hmm. Um and you know she, she as long as you know as long as I'm on the book she's not going anywhere. Um, yeah, so she she's great and getting to like expand on her and like you know give her more to do. Um, but you know I got to introduce uh, Mona Lisa, which was cool. And I had actually never like I knew you know it's hard to avoid the character just like in the fandom. You know there's like a ton of fan art and talk about her and stuff like that. And then she was in the, um, the 2012 series, but I had never actually seen the full episode of the old show with her until like a few years ago. And cause I was thinking about like, um, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't taken the, the, um, main turtles job yet, but I was just like, Oh, like what would I do if I introduced Mona Lisa just kind of from like a fan perspective and, so I was already like thinking about like what I would do with her. So that was really cool getting to bring her in. Um, but but yeah, there's Lita. Um, who else have we got? Oh, Diamond the porcupine. She's pretty cool. Um, who else is there? I'm blanking on like my own comics. Oh no worries. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to ask about the relationship between Alplex and Raphael as well. What's going on there? Oh, God. I was just like, you know, people were, you know, kind of shipping them from the very beginning. And, you know, in the original Raph uh, micro issue, like Alplex was there. And they kind of had, you know, they were like enemies or whatever. And then she you know, slowly went over to their side. And there's like kind of hints you know, as to like what their, uh, their, uh, their relationship was. And then, uh, Tom and I did like issue number 66 where it's like more explicit where like Raph is just like, you know, yeah, I'm into her, but you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. And I just felt like, I don't know. It, it felt like a long time coming and I was just like, I was like, okay, I can't, I can't do this will they or won't they thing like <laughs> those books. I can't handle that. So let's just do it. Done. They're like, you know, they're together finally after like a hundred thousand issues or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely interested to see the other relationships as well. Like we still I feel like we're eventually gonna have to hit that wall between Casey and uh Jenica, of course, once again on those. And then there's a little bit between uh Mona Lisa and Donatello a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So, I'm curious to see where that goes. Yeah, that was something I hadn't I hadn't like planned to to do that. But like when I was doing the scripts and doing the artwork, because like a lot of my scripts are pretty, I don't know, like bare bones. Because like when I write for something that I'm drawing, you know, it's like I don't put a lot of detail because I know what it's going to be. I know what it is in my head. So, like, a lot of the Mona and Donatello stuff at first, like, wasn't even in the script. And, like, as I was, like, writing and drawing, I kept, you know, kind of running into these moments with them. And I was just like, huh, like, keep having them, like, you know, interact and, like, run into each other. Like, maybe I should, you know, pursue that a bit and see what happens. Um, yeah, so that's pretty cool. I don't know. I don't know if, like, what I'm going to do... I don't know what I'm going to do with Casey and Jenica yet. Mm. Um, Cause like, I don't know their, their relationship was like, you know, fairly, fairly fleeting in the scheme of things. I think. Um, yeah. Know. We got Lord Smaff in the chat. He says he does love that Jenica dynamic with Raphael as well. It doesn't take Raph's nonsense. I, yeah. love, I do like their relationship quite a yeah, bit. Yeah, definitely. I felt like, I feel like that was, um, like when I like when I took over, um, I felt like I had to do kind of a lot of groundwork. Like you know, Jenica, she was, you know, hanging out with the turtles before, and then she was mutated, and then, 
there was like, you know, all, all the city at war stuff, like all the dragon stuff going on. And I felt like there hadn't been a time where she just kind of like, um, you know, is part of the group. She just sits down like everybody else is just there. And I felt like I had to like, okay, well now they're not, you know, fighting for the fate of the city anymore. So they're going to have to all sit down in the same place and like interact in some way. So I had to like, you know, I wanted to figure out like what her dynamics with each turtle was. And I always feel like how a character deals with Raph is kind of like a litmus test. You know? <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking about it like, okay, like when Raph is like, you know, flying off the handle or whatever, like, you know, Leo, he kind of, they butt heads or whatever. Leo tries to like, control Raph. Michelangelo, he kind of like, you know, tries to like diffuse Raph and make it, you know, like ease the tensions or whatever. Donatello, he just kind of just like, oh, I'm out of here. And he just <laughs> And so I was like, well, what's, what's like missing from that? And I thought Jenica should kind of be like, she just has like no time for like, Raft nonsense, yeah. yeah. She's just like, Oh, stop whining! Like, oh, we don't have, like, you're such a baby. <laughs> I feel like, and Raf is just, you know, he's never heard something like that before from his brothers or whatever. So, I thought that would be a fun dynamic. Um, somebody who just, you know, she butts heads with him like Leo does, but she doesn't try to like control him and like put it like she doesn't try to get him in line the way Leo does. She's just kind of makes fun of him, which I thought really fun. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, so I feel like, you know, in the recent years, there's been this, this push for diversity in comics, which is great. And there's been a big push for, you know, black characters and female characters and, and stuff. But I feel like there's still a lacking um, diversity for LGBTQ characters. And I want to get your thoughts on what we could do to kind of get that more in the forefront. Yeah, I mean, when I was working on uh, Jim and the Holograms, and, like we made that like super gay, so that, that worked mm -hmm. out really well. Um, yeah, in Turtles, like, you know, there's been a little bit, there's, there's uh, like Lindsay, um, who I definitely want to bring back, I love her. Um, yeah, actually, is that it for is that it internals? I feel like I'm blanking on somebody else. I don't know, but regardless, yeah, yeah. But like it, I, as an in industry as a whole, I feel like oh, you know, there's okay. still there's still kind of some like people there's they still kind of shy away from that minority group. Um, um yeah, I mean, I guess in like you know in the big companies, you know, like DC, Marvel you know, there's still kind of like this uh, trepidation about it. But, um, you know, in terms of like indie comics and like web comics and stuff like that, I feel like, or like, you know, like bigger, uh, bigger publishing houses, like, like for second and uh, Scholastic and stuff like that. I feel like, you know, there's like a really good number of queer creators and stories and I feel like DC and Marvel, they're kind of like the outliers in a way. Yeah, for when sure. When it comes to this. Sometimes I feel like you need the loudest voice in the room to be on your side, even if there's a lot of smaller voices. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I feel like, and it's hard with, with DC and, and Marvel because, you know, it's like they're mostly using... Uh, telling stories about these characters who have like been around for like decades right and, and then kind of like pair that with you know they uh, you know now they're part of Disney who is like you know historically like maybe even more resistant to that than Marvel's ever been um and it's just like I don't know it, it's uh, I don't know how to change it I don't know I don't know besides right. just like more you know, queer people behind the page, behind the camera, you know, in the board boardroom meetings, whatever they do. Um, I think, I think that, I think like, I don't know. 
I, mean, I, guess, I guess my my follow up to that would be: it, Do you think it is important for the big two to kind of focus on that, or do you think it's all right that you know there's a lot of representation in more indie and small publisher books that you know if people want to find things they identify with, there it's out there. But I feel like personally, I think that you know if it's kind of in the background a bit, it's not as it's still kind of like not where it should be. Yeah, because I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, there's obviously an audience for those other books, and you know, like you know, like Random House and and Simon and Schuster and stuff like they outsell most of Marvel and DC stuff. So, but it's like you know, the audience or like public perception is not there with those other publishers. So, right, it would definitely be nice, you know, if. Um, Especially with the movies, I guess. Like, if Marvel suddenly had this, like, you know, queer superhero starring in a big movie, and maybe that would, like, kind of trickle down. Right. You know, the comics, because the comics, they tend to kind of reflect the movies in some way. Um, I, I, my, my concern would be that they would do it in a way that would, like, be like, oh, see what we're doing here, rather than just yeah. make it a thing and not make it a thing, you know, which I think is the right way to do it. You just, like this character happens to be gay or this ca yeah. character, you know, whatever their orientation is. And it's just not like a thing. It's just part of who they are as a character. But yeah, I feel I, like, I feel like the, the industry still like is not close to that. No. Yeah. And yeah, like it would, you know, it would be nice if they were and, you know, like maybe I would, I would read more of those superhero comics if they had more, you know, gay and trans characters and stuff like that. But I look at, um, you know, the creators behind a lot of those books aren't queer. I mean, you know, some are like, so, you know, some are obviously, but like a lot aren't. And I just, I feel like without the creators kind of pushing, without the editors yeah. pushing that, it's just going to kind of be business as usual or, um, and especially because, like, a lot of those comics, like, you know, the creative teams, like, they cycle, you yeah. know, and work on, like, you know, character X, and, like, different people will, will, like, work on character X, and a lot of times, you know, like, I think there was, like, um, there was, like, a trans character in, like, Angela or something like that, and I remember, like, you know, people were, like, oh, this is great, this is a big deal, and then, she just kind of like out like after the creative team just move on like just moves on like a lot of the queer it's characters kind of like, drop. Introduced, they kind of yeah. fall by the wayside or they get written out or they just don't you know they don't like necessarily get killed off or anything but they just don't get used just right they're phased out of the story right yeah they just kind of you know the new writers are like well you know i don't really have any ideas for this other character you know i really want to write spider-man so then they you know they just kind of by the wayside um but yeah it would, it would definitely be nice like you're saying if you know there was like kind of a big push or change you know i don't know maybe maybe someday that'll happen i don't know yeah so as we're winding down here i think i got one more turtle question so <laughs> As the book continues, is there a certain character we need to keep our eyes on? I know, obviously, Lita showing up from the future would be one big one. But are there any other characters that like are going to get like this big creative push in the book soon? Um, let me think without giving anything away. Hmm. Hey, give it away. It's all right. Exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a I have a big thing for Sally coming up. Nice. Um. Yeah, that's big. And I'm finally going to have uh, Saki show up, Shredder, at some point. Because he's been, like, kind of lurking in the background, like, watching the turtles, you know? Yeah. Um, so he'll he'll finally show up and, like, make his presence known or whatever. Um, and who else? I have a couple. I have a couple. uh like classic characters that I'm finally getting to put in, but I won't reveal who those are, but mm -hmm. keep an eye out for some familiar faces. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure after we wrap up 
I'll think of some, I'll think of the character I should have mentioned. Like, oh, I forgot this character. <laughs> huge storyline coming up. But very good. All right, so we're getting ready to sign off on this panel here. So, where can people find you uh, if they um, want to get in contact or just find your work? I'm mostly active on Twitter. I'm at uh, Mooncalf One, M O O N C A L F E One. Um, and that's that's pretty much my home base. That's where you know I tweet, I post artwork, I post pictures of my toys, uh, you know, stuff like that. That's my main hub. Um, I have a Patreon, which I'm blanking on the address right now. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure people can probably Google Sophie Campbell Patreon and find it. It's on. It's on my Twitter. It's, it, okay, it, there you go. Nice. If you want to go, pay me some money. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much where I am. Is on Twitter. Awesome. awesome. Well, we thank you so much for joining us. I know it was a short notice thing, and <laughs> we definitely appreciate you making the time this afternoon and joining us and talking turtles. Uh, so, any uh, closing thoughts for the the live people watching? Um, thanks for tuning in and thanks for, uh, reading my turtle books. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you for making them. Absolutely. Once thanks again, for joining Cal us. <laughs> Cal right. thank, thank you, Good Sophie. Morning. And, uh, yeah. enjoy the rest of your weekend. I just hit the leave studio button here to get out. Yeah, that'll definitely work. Yeah. We can do this too. <laughs> So big thanks to All right. so we'll be back for hopping in. And uh, we'll be back with more mainframe Comic Con a little bit. This stream is actually going to end, uh, but another stream will pop up in just a minute. Hope you're enjoying it. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>